Hey there, Mr. Reddit here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled Parent Stories. Today we have a very special episode for you, a compilation of some of the greatest Entitled Parent Stories we've read over the past year. So sit back, relax, and enjoy a few hours of the most Entitled Parents you've ever heard of. And by the way, Karen assured me that if this video gets 1000 likes, she won't try to speak to anyone's manager for an entire week. So please smash that like button. And if you're new, subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. And become an official member of the ReArmy today, and I'll give you a shout out in an upcoming video. R slash Entitled Parents. I told Karen she shouldn't expect guys to stick around if she isn't upfront about having a kid. I'm 30 male, and my friend Sarah, 30 female, is a single mother to a four year old. In the last few years, she's been dating guys hiding the fact that she has a kid until things start getting serious or accidentally gets outed and they all get scared off when they find out. Rinse and repeat. She confided in me, asking me for insight into the mind of guys like you, single, sober, liberal-minded, financially stable and open to a serious relationship. Now I'm just getting back into the dating pool. I don't have kids, but it's not a deal breaker for me. I've always wanted to be a father and I'm not hung up on biology. I've always wanted to adopt slash foster at least one kid, but I told her dating women with kids requires a different approach at every stage for everyone than women without. There's an ex, custody, managing expectations, planning around her kid's schedule, not getting attached prematurely, etc. And that's all before even thinking about living together, let alone marriage. So she shouldn't be surprised guys don't stick around once they find out she's been lying to them about something astronomical. It's a jerk move, bordering an entrapment. She called me a jerk and insensitive to the struggles of a lonely single mom. Am I the jerk? Edit. Wow, the sheer volume of responses is overwhelming. Thanks for the insight and the awards are greatly appreciated. Some clarifications. She hasn't really been dating these guys, as in going on dates. Rather, it usually begins as merely a hookup without much talking about personal stuff, but then turns into a repeating thing and eventually morphs into something more but without the groundwork of dating properly. Update. We talked again. I apologized for being blunt. I'm on the spectrum. I can come off as harsh when I'm trying to be sweet and the like, but reiterated my position using human words derived from your comments. Then she came clean, sort of. The whole time she was trying to gauge me out. Some background. We met 15-ish years ago and I liked her but was friend zoned. We became close and at 18 we made a pact that if we're both single at 30 we'd get married. Over the years she's dated, I've dated. I shot my shot a few times in between and got rejected every time. But then she got salty every time I met someone new and tried to low-key sabotage me. At some point, I gave her an ultimatum. Either we go out and see where it goes or she backs off. Either way is fine, but I'm not going to be her backup plan. It hurt, but I respected her choice to date her ex, who turned out to be a cheating jerk. I friend zoned her and moved on to date my ex. With the benefit of hindsight, I'm glad we never dated. It would have never worked. Our personalities and values have evolved and are incompatible. Well, what do you think? Was OP a jerk for what he said to Karen or not? Please let us know. I've been hiding my kid from my previous marriage in the attic for 15 years. Oh, so that's what those noises were. Entitled mom won't watch her kids. They climb into the pasture with my horses. So I've referenced this story a couple of times to people and decided that I'd tell the full tale. I live in a rural neighborhood. Everyone's got three to eight acres, so we're all pretty spaced out. I live on five acres and my nearest neighbors are a sweet elderly couple about one acre from me. They're perfect. The husband does yard work as a hobby and his wife bakes. We have a nice agreement where if I need something big chainsawed, he takes the wood down and uses it for the fireplace. And in exchange, I trade recipes and bake with his wife. Honestly, they just like the company. I own my own home, have two horses, a cat, and recently my mom has also moved in because she was in financial trouble. I'm happy to help as she's good company and I'd do anything for her. And then everything changed when lockdown attacked. So here's where things go south. My neighbor's son and his family, wife and two girls, four and seven, live in the nearest city and didn't feel safe. I don't blame them. And because my neighbors are saints, they opened their home and the brood moved right in. Up until this point, I was the youngest person in the neighborhood at 29, 
so having kids wander around is new for everyone. At first, it was no big issue. They stayed inside, got settled, maybe they were good kids. Total long shot, I know, but a girl can hope. So one morning, I'm letting my horses out into the front pasture, a Clydesdale and a Welsh pony, and I hear the most high-pitched squealing from next door. It was so shrill, my Clydesdale second guessed going outside, but cautiously proceeded, only to be met with more squeals. I pop my head out, and the two girls are literally losing their minds. And I get it, little white pony and the horse from Brave. But still, they're large animals they don't know, so they should have the sense not to approach, right? Pfft, not a snowball's chance in heck. These kids sprint to the fence shrieking. The pony runs around in panic, and the Clydesdale stands there with the same confused look I've got on my face. Then the four-year-old starts to go under the fence. Heck no. Don't you dare climb under that fence, I said firmly and admittedly kind of harsh, but I'll be darned if she gets hurt by my horse. I walk over to them and they look like they're about to cry, but I explain firmly that the big animals could hurt them easily and to never go over or under the fence. They go home. I clean the stalls. An hour in, I hear someone banging on my home's door and I can see through my barn's hatch door my mom and the kid's mom are having a conversation. The kid's mom then storms down to the barn. I've never met this lady, but I know an entitled parent when I see one. Joy of joys. She starts going off on me. How dare you make my kids cry? They just wanted to see the ponies. Blah, blah, blah. But when she takes a breath, I get my point across. Ma'am, your youngest was crawling under the fence towards two large animals none of you know. That Clydesdale is a 2,000 pound draft horse. He can literally crush you, not feel it, and do permanent damage. The pony looks cute, but needs an experienced hand as he is very untrustworthy, flighty, and has a tendency to bite. Your kids are not allowed near them without my consent and heavy supervision, and never allowed in the pasture with them. Do you understand? She then starts ranting about, Well, if they're so dangerous, why do you have them? Are you even allowed to have them? I should call animal control. That crap. One, they're my personal horses. Yes, I'm allowed to have them. Two, your kids trespassed on my property. I'm trying to keep them safe. Three, this is not a petting zoo. She huffs off. I continue work. Later that evening, when the husband gets home, I explained what happened. He's understandably alarmed, and I explained how dangerous that situation is. He agrees. Not that my horses are aggressive, mind you, but it's inherently dangerous in general. You've got a 50 to 200 pound human versus an 800 to 2,000 pound horse. If you don't know what you're doing, you can be seriously injured. Pure physics. So I'm optimistic with his reaction, but no, he's often not home, so I stay cautious. Later in the next week, I'm working from home and I suddenly hear screaming. Not excited screaming, scared little kid screaming. I rushed outside and the four-year-old is bawling in the middle of the pasture with the pony doing laps around the perimeter of the fences as my Clydesdale slowly approaches her. The seven-year-old is crying outside the fence and calling for her mom, but clearly their mom is not watching them. My initial terror recedes a bit because my Clydesdale is essentially a golden retriever in a horse's body, sweetest pushover in the world. He's gingerly approaching her in a slow, friendly way and being as non-threatening as he can and with him so close, the pony won't rush them. He's probably about three steps from her, but I yell for him to halt, and like a good boy, he does. I make my way in with them and start asking the girl questions. Are you hurt? Being paramount, she's not, but she's clearly scared, so I pick her up and walk out, making my Clydesdale heel to me just in case the pony gets a dumb idea. The mom is still nowhere in sight, so I take them to my neighbors. What proceeds is about 30 minutes of screaming and crying. The girl's mother was the one to open the door. She starts screaming at me and firing off questions before my neighbors intervene. I tell everyone exactly what happened and my elderly neighbors blew up at her, not me. They screamed at her for being so irresponsible and negligent, how they could have been heard. The mom tried throwing blame on me, but they weren't having it. My neighbors apologize profusely and I go about my day until the husband gets home. He came by and apologized too for his family's behavior and especially the behavior of his wife. I accepted it and said I understood. They're just kids. I too know the allure of magnificent fluffy horses. The mom was at fault for not watching the kids. I'm just glad everyone was okay. 
The girls were still really shook up, so I extended an olive branch. Because, well, I was an overexcited kid who liked horses once too, just with a horse mom who knew what she was doing. And I didn't want this to completely scare them from being around horses. So the next day, I properly introduced them to my Clydesdale, with him in his stall with the inside hatch open and the girls being supervised by their father and me, safe in the barn. They loved it. Clydesdale loves the attention. Everyone's happy, right? Well, except the mom, who took my olive branch as an offer to teach them horseback riding, give free lessons, and other crap. But her husband shot it down hard, and presumably so did my neighbors. Since then, it's been quiet. I did, however, install a second electrical wire on the bottom, not just on the top, just in case. And yes, they did test it. Seven-year-old got zapped pretty good and got in trouble with her dad. Aside from that, there have been no incidents other than them wanting to pet them when I drop evening feet once in a while. Here's hoping it stays peaceful. But seriously, don't go up to animals you don't know. Have you ever been horseback riding? If not, would you like to? Please let us know. I used to have a horse named Epona. She was the best. You're not giving me an ETA for a fix? I'll flood your ticketing system. This happened around 2012. Back then, I used to live in Southern Europe, one of the Mediterranean countries. I was a university student in a remote, rural place. I had just moved to a new apartment and, naturally, my first order of business was to make sure that I have a running internet connection. The problem was that, due to the place I was living in being so remote, there was only one ISP provider available. You didn't like the provider? Too bad. Anyway, I signed the necessary paperwork in time, moved to the new place, set up the router and all, and thankfully my connection is fine. That is, until day 3 or 4, when out of nowhere, my internet connection dies, but my phone line was working normally. Okay, no probs. I call the ISP to open a ticket. The representative tells me that they will get back to me soon. A few days pass by and I get nothing, so I decide to call them again. The representative tells me that they are still investigating the problem and that they will get back to me soon. Now, this is the point where I'm starting to get frustrated. I know that the internet in the area is fine. In fact, my next door neighbor's internet connection is great, so the problem must be something that is easily fixable, right? Wrong. A week has passed by and I call them again. This time, the representative tells me that they have investigated the issue and the problem is officially of unknown origin, which means that they cannot give me an ETA for the fix. I hang up the phone, feeling sad and perplexed. As I contemplate my internetless existence, the representative words echo in my mind. Unknown origin. We cannot give you an ETA. Slowly, my sadness transforms into denial. How is this even possible? My phone connection still works, so the line is still there. And I know for a fact that everyone in the area has a stable internet connection. This must be a simple bug that is easily fixable. This can only mean one thing. Some jerk has not been doing their job properly. The denial becomes anger. How dare they tell me that they cannot give me an ETA? This should be illegal. What if my job depends on my internet connection? Not to mention that internet access is a basic human right. They are denying me my rights by not giving me an ETA. At this point, the issue stops being the internet connection. It's about the principle of the matter. As a human being and a customer, I am entitled to an ETA. I call the ISP again and I try to explain my flawless reasoning. No luck. The poor representative who listens to my rant tells me that the only thing I can do is open a new ticket. Shocked by my inability to define my fate, I accept his offer and hang up. And then a magnificent idea is born. Since the only thing that I can do is to open a new ticket, then this is exactly what I'm going to do. From that point on, I was calling my ISP provider two to five times per day. Each time, I was telling the representative the same thing. This is what has happened. I know that there are multiple tickets with my names on them already, but I want you to open a new one. Most of the representatives were pretty amused by my story. Everyone complied. A month later, yes, a month passed without the issue having been fixed. I get a call from the regional tech executive of the ISP. The call goes like this. Executive. Long angry rant. You must stop opening tickets. You're flooding our ticketing system. More long angry rant. At first, I was shocked at how aggressive the executive was. He was clearly one step away from starting to call me names, and I knew that the only reason this didn't happen was that these calls are being recorded. 
And then my shock transformed into a visible, glorious joy. You see, my friends, this is the point where I realized that I was winning. Me. Well, are you going to give me an ETA for a fix? Executive. We cannot give you an ETA. The problem is of an unknown origin. Me. Then I guess I'll keep opening tickets. Executive hangs up. To cut a long story short, this exchange renewed my passion for crushing the souls of those who have wronged me, so I kept opening tickets at the same pace for another 30 to 40 days. I estimate that in the course of the total, around 70 days that this lasted, I must have opened more than 250 tickets. One day my phone rings. I pick it up and it's an ISP representative who tells me this. Mr. Lexmeet, is this you? Your problem has been solved. Everyone at the ISP is talking about you. Indeed, on that day, my internet connection was back. The cool part about this, however, was that I had internet all along. Remember my next door neighbor? She was kind enough to let me know her Wi-Fi password since day one. What would you do if your internet stopped working for a month? Please let us know. Oh, don't even say that, Mr. Reddit. Talk about a nightmare. School? Nah, I think Starbucks instead. I've seen quite a few back in high school stories lately and thought I'd share my own experience. So to set the stage, I graduated high school in 2013 and my senior year was a challenge. My sister passed away. My health took a nosedive thanks to chronic illnesses that were progressively getting worse. I crashed and totaled a car. Not my fault, but not a fun experience nonetheless. I had two concussions. You get the idea. The first half of the year, tardy skyrocketed among the student body. The school changed the student parking areas and basically made it so that any students who drove themselves and any students who used the door closest to that parking lot were caught in a huge bottleneck and any one student goofing off could potentially keep literally hundreds of students from entering the building. It was ridiculous. Additionally, they decreased the between class passing period from 7 minutes to 5 minutes. Mind you, if you were to walk from one end of the school to the other when the halls were completely empty, it would take you at least 5 minutes. Add 1,200 other people to the mix, and even 7 minutes was a time crunch. So, tardies increased. A lot. And the administration got it in their heads that the best way to remedy the situation is to implement new punishments for being late to class. Prior to this year, after 5 tardies, you had to attend an after-school detention with the teacher of whatever class you had missed. That's it. If you skipped class, unexcused by a parent or doctor, 5 times, you received an in-school suspension. And if you missed more than 20 days of a class, excused or not, you had to repeat the class. There were some exceptions to that, but they were basically for major events. The new rules were ridiculous. If you were tardy to a class three times, you received a suspension. If you skipped the class altogether, unexcused, you received a suspension. All it took was once. If you received three suspensions, then you had to retake the class. But if an absence was excused, then there were no consequences. Oh, and they got rid of the 20-day absence slash repeat rule. So, on to the fun. I was just burnt out by the end of that first semester. I was stressed and upset and dealing with horrible panic attacks after my sister's passing. My body constantly hurt thanks to undiagnosed pain conditions and I couldn't stay awake in class to save my life. I was just over dealing with BS. I spent the entire first semester running from class to class because my classes were clear across the school from each other. I lived less than six miles from the school, but was leaving over an hour before school started because of all the road construction going on between my house and the school. There was no way out of my subdivision that didn't involve a mile or more of closed lanes. Plus, there was construction on the road leading to the only entrance to the student parking lot. It was BS. I was a bit too tightly wound at the time. I was a straight A student and all the AP classes I could fit in my schedule, and I had never, ever been late to class. So being late to a couple classes that first semester was extremely upsetting, but I still hadn't even managed to warrant a detention. End of the first semester rolls around, and we're all given a letter notifying us and our parents to the attendance change. Except they didn't include the change to the 20 absence slash repeat rule. It just wasn't there at all. They were hoping by not including it in the letter, the change would be overlooked. It was not. So second semester rolls around, and my class schedule was changed because of human error, and I get thrown in a weightlifting class that I would never have signed up for if you paid me to. I was upset. I was tired and in pain, and you had better believe lifting heavy objects for an hour a day, four days a week, was not my idea of a good time. The weekly swimming day was alright though. 
And then more construction showed up on my route to school. And I was late. Very late. As in, arrived to school midway through second period. So I'm in the office, in tears, being written up with a suspension thanks to citywide road construction, and the attendant secretary and counselor who oversaw these matters are showing no mercy or leniency. I'm handed the write-up to sign and a copy of the attendance policy in full, and lo and behold, the change to the 20 absent slash repeat rule is on there, as is the word unexcused, as in all unexcused absences will result in a one-day suspension. Do you see it? Do you see the loophole? I cackled. I flat out cackled. Pulled out my cell phone, called my mom, said, Hey, I'll explain later, but I need you to call the school and excuse me from my first and second period. Thank you. Love you. Bye. And before I could even slide my phone back in my pocket, the attendance line rings. To say the secretary and counselor were upset would be an understatement, but I wasn't done yet. After gleefully shredding the write-up, I asked if this copy of the attendance policy was mine to keep and proceeded to highlight the word unexcused and the change to the 20-day absence slash repeat policy. I then turned to the counselor, me. So, I want to be sure I understand this correctly. If I show up late three times, I get suspended? Counselor, correct, said very snobbishly. Me, if I ditch class, I get suspended? Correct, said as he crossed his arms like he was trying to be extra intimidating. Me, but if I get my mom to call or write me a note excusing me from class, there are no repercussions? Correct. You could see him trying to work out if he still had the upper hand. But good luck getting a parent to agree to that. Me. And it doesn't matter at all how many days I miss. The 20-day absence slash repeat rule has been eliminated in full with no replacement. And that's when he understood the loophole I'd found. I kid you not, watching that man crumple as he came to the conclusion that I found a way around the suspensions was the best fall of man I've ever seen. He uncrossed his arms and seemed to deflate straight onto a chair. Correct. Me. Wonderful. Thank you for your time. I've got some time before third period, so I'm going to go hit the vending machines. Bye. And off I went. Strolled into third period with pretzels and a Coke, happy as a clam. That night, my mom wrote me out roughly 50 notes that read, I excuse elf from blank period. If you have any questions, please give me a call at my work number. Signed, Elf's mom. And she repeated writing out those notes a month or so later. I skipped everything. Gonna be cutting close to making it to first period? Skip it. Hit Starbucks instead. Don't want to go to that stupid weightlifting class? Don't. Take a 90-minute lunch instead. Overslept? Well, get some breakfast on the way to third period, but then skip that awful weightlifting class and come back for fifth and sixth periods. Need more time to study for a test or finish a project? Skip the morning altogether and only come in for that math test. Go home after second period to get ahead on that project. That weightlifting class? After the first few weeks, I attended the swimming days and the game days, soccer or dodgeball, nothing else. Think about that. One, maybe two days a week, for the whole semester. If I attended 30 classes total, I'd be surprised. And of course, they called my mom to verify the notes and she flat out told them she had supplied me with fill-in-the-blank notes and she would gladly verify them all as legitimate. The sheer amount of times I hit Starbucks at 9am on a school day was astounding and it was done on purpose. I was flaunting that I had skipped classes. Every time I walked into that office with a Starbucks cup and a note, I saw a little glimmer of fury in the secretary's eye. If the counselor was there, he'd lean against a wall and glare, but he couldn't do anything to stop me. Our district had a strict policy change policy, which meant that any changes to things like attendance policies and dress code had to be implemented at the start of a semester and had to remain in place for the duration of the semester. That counselor tried to appeal to the school board to change the policy at every single meeting that semester. I attended the first one. One of the school board members lost it laughing at the situation. He asked, what idiot wrote this policy? And that counselor turned Coke can red. They basically told him that he had made this mess, he could deal with the fallout. They returned to the previous attendance policy the following school year. But as I was a senior, that didn't matter to me. Naturally, I told others of my discovery, and soon enough, everyone was exploiting this loophole. Of course, some parents wouldn't excuse their kids, but enough would. We all showed up on count day, though. My grades stayed at their previous level, and my mental and physical health improved as I was no longer running myself into the ground. All I know is that without that loophole, I would have run myself into the ground and probably ended up in the hospital. That loophole saved my life, 
And after all, all I did was ask my mother to excuse my absences. It's not my fault I was allowed more than 20. Edit. I saw a fair question about the legality of truancy and how schools don't have to accept notes as excuses, but the comment was deleted before I could reply. Schools don't have to accept parental excuses indefinitely. That was why this was so dumb. The school got in a ridiculous amount of trouble for the number of absences that semester, but it happened after the fact, and I'm not sure if it was trouble at the district or state level. I do know that the counselor doesn't work for the district anymore, but I don't know when that separation happened. I checked and checked again and checked again after that, that I wasn't doing myself over in getting my diploma. And none of the underclassmen who took advantage of the policy had to repeat anything in the following years. So it really was this weird fluke that ended up with perfect timing as far as I'm concerned. As for not accepting notes after a certain point, that was part of the change in policy. Up until that semester, anything over five excused absences had to be a doctor's note. So my mom could call me five times, but the other 15, to hit the 20 limit, had to be a signed doctor's note. The new policy did not include that requirement anymore. Why? Who knows? I think the logic, if you can call it that, behind the new policy was that they thought parents wouldn't excuse their kids' absences for no particular reason. My mom did not give a darn if I actually went to school as long as my grades stayed good. She knew I was struggling and school was the main factor in that. As it was, I could have gotten a doctor's note for an extended absence. I didn't know at the time, but the constant pain and fatigue were flares of disabilities that would have guaranteed me excused absences by a doctor. When I was finally diagnosed a few years later, my PCP was surprised I had actually made it through high school given how sick I was slash am. I wish I knew where my report card from that semester was. I kept it because the absences are listed and were utterly insane. But you're totally right. I have no idea how I escaped any state attendance requirements, but I sure as heck wasn't about to ask them. Am I the jerk for turning off his debit card after I found him sending his brother money weekly in secret? All right, y'all. I'm actually still really upset right now, so if I come off as tense, I apologize. I'm 28, female. He is 29, male. His brother is 34, male. As of last month, my boyfriend lost his job after the rise of cases at his workplace took over. They closed their doors with no definite return date, but from everyone's understanding, it's going to be weeks, with the possibility of remote work, but again, no definite. Therefore, I have been pulling more hours to make up for the loss of his income. I have two sons as well. My bills run roughly $1,900 a month and my income is only $2,600. So generally speaking, the extra goes toward food and basic needs. Last week, by the mercy of God, I was given a promotion as well as a $1,500 bonus for being with the company for six years. With that said, we had some extra money. Well, I went on break about 30 minutes ago and when I took off my headset, I heard my boyfriend speaking to his brother on speakerphone. His brother asked him to send over the weekly amount. I eavesdropped and then checked my bank statements. We have a joint account and have found that he has been sending his brother $50 to $75 a week. I confronted him and he said he had been helping his brother out with gas money so he could get to and from work. I said, well, that's the end of that actually because I'm not supporting your brother and wouldn't even if I could afford it. His response was, I'm not going to just stop helping my brother. He needs me. I immediately went on and turned off access to his debit card and told him, since you want to take my money without my permission when I could be using it for food for our kids, you'll no longer have access to any of the money at all. He's saying I'm being ignorant and that it wasn't breaking the bank. I told him I didn't care and refused to turn his card back on. Am I the jerk? ETA, been together 13 years. All money in the account is money that I have busted my butt for since he has not been working for a little over a month. He started sending his brother money on January 5th, seven days after he lost his job. He was already blowing through the portion of money that was his in our shared account and is now plugging away at my money. ETA again. I should have included originally that his brother has already bled his sisters and moms dry of funds because he takes his paychecks and spends them on various women constantly. He's always going after women who need help, once even offering up his housing so a woman who never worked a day in her life could have a roof over her head, which meant that he had to move out because she didn't trust sleeping in the same house with him. So I doubt this money was for gas. This is just a lie, he told my boyfriend. Well, what do you think? Was it wrong for OP to turn off her boyfriend's card or not? Please let us know. What's wrong is that she's not kicking him out. Where did you find these guys? 
Karen mother insults the way I raise my own kids. I, 23, female, have two kids, a daughter who's five and a son who's three. My style of parenting is not the most popular. One main thing of mine is I do not punish my kids. I ignore bad behavior and I reward good behavior. Or if they're doing something wrong, I simply redirect them. It works amazing for me and my kids and they're both very well adjusted and behaved. Something else I do is give them full control over their own bodies. They decide how they want their hair and what clothes they wear. My daughter has a shaved head and she's honestly rocking it. My parents, specifically my mother, hate this. My sister had a wedding and asked them to wear formal clothes. My daughter wore a suit and my son wore a dress, which upset pretty much everyone. My sister was thankfully okay with it and said while she'd have appreciated my daughter in a dress to be a bridesmaid, she understood it was her decision to make, not ours. She didn't mind my son because he was flower boy and she said him wearing a dress fit the aesthetic better, so a win all round. Anyway, my mother is getting increasingly upset. She gets upset when she wants a hug and they say no and I don't force them to hug her. She continues to buy my daughter feminine clothes that get promptly donated to charity and insists on buying my son boys toys, which he never uses. This has become a huge problem. She's upset because she thinks my kids don't like her and I explained they'd like her more if she just left them alone. They can talk, they have opinions, ask them how they're feeling and work with that. Recently, this has progressed into her calling me a neglectful mother. Apparently, they'll never learn boundaries, which makes me laugh because she's the one who doesn't understand boundaries, but I digress. Apparently, they'll never grow up and will be bullied in school and become snowflakes. She also claims they'll become badly behaved once they grow up. I think she's being a jerk for trying to change the way that I parent and she thinks I'm driving a force between my kids and her. Am I the jerk? Edit. Since I've posted this, I've gotten many, many comments. I apologize for not being able to reply to them all. Every comment I've received can be placed into these categories. Someone who is neglected, praising me and saying I'm what they wished they had slash asking me to adopt them, which honestly warms my heart. You all deserved so much better and I would adopt you if I could. Someone asking for parenting advice, which I'm more than happy to help out with. My number one tip is just go with your gut. Be the parent you wished you had. Mistakes are okay. Apologize and move on. And finally, people who are telling me I'm creating monsters and I should burn for all of eternity. Which is valid, I guess. My parenting works for me. If it needs adjusting for them in the future, then I will adjust it. But my children are good kids. They aren't evil. They understand boundaries and behave more than your average kid. So I'm really not worried about them in the real world. They'll be fine. And of course, I've had the odd bits of advice, which I also really appreciate. I've been informed the way I discipline my kids isn't ignoring them, it's just a lesser known way. Negative punishment, positive rewards. I explain their bad behavior to my kids and why it wasn't good. And it's worked perfectly so far. If it needs adjusting in the future, I will do so. And I've had quite a few professionals tell me this is the preferred method of discipline, so I'm sticking with it for now. As for the wedding incident, I discussed everything with my sister and we bought my daughter's suit slash son's dress two months before the wedding. At first, she didn't like that my daughter wouldn't be wearing a dress, but I explained some personal things to her that I will not be putting on the internet, and we came to an agreement. She still was a little upset, but said she'd rather have my daughter in the bridesmaid photos in a suit than not in them at all. By the time the wedding actually happened, she seemed very happy with it and wasn't as upset as beforehand. I think she just needed time to adjust, and she asked my son to be in a dress. I was going to put him in a suit because tiny suits are adorable, but she specifically asked and he was very happy to wear a princess dress. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or is grandma? Please let us know. I can't wait to read what our listeners have to say about this one. Cut my salary in half? Kiss your business goodbye. The cast. Names changed for anonymity. Me, your storyteller at the moment. Chad, hiring CTO. Richard, CEO, brother of Chad. Big Bro, engineer coworker, and Eddie, IT and desktop support guy. This takes place near the very beginning of my software engineering career, back in 05 or 06. I'd just been let go from my previous place of employment due to being compliant with directives I'd been given, although not maliciously, so that story wouldn't be appropriate here, sadly. And thus working myself out of a job. I was a young college dropout from a technical college that hadn't been federally accredited yet, and thus all my student loans were from banks and loan companies instead of from Uncle Sam and debts were due. I was also making payments on my very first car, 
even though it was a beater that the prior owners had already nearly driven into the ground, four years old and nearly 200,000 miles on it when I bought it, and of course, rent and utilities. The job I had just been let go from already had me working paycheck to paycheck as they paid far under average rate, but I was still new professional, so I couldn't be very choosy. I was living in Los Angeles County, so the cost of living was so bad, I was having to choose which bills were going to be late on a monthly basis. Specifically, I was living in a town called San Pedro, a small town tucked fairly out of the way. After blasting my resume to all the job boards, I get a call from a startup who seems interested in my resume and wants me to come in for a face-to-face -face interview, skipping the call screen entirely. In my desperation, I agree. I'm given an address, which is all the way up in Woodland Hills. I check the internet, 55 minute drive so long as there's no traffic. With traffic, it looks like the commute will be more like an hour and 45 minutes each way. I'm desperate though, and literally nobody else has reached out to me about my resume or responded to my applications, so I go to the interview. I arrive to a mostly empty office complex, maybe six or seven other cars in a parking lot capable of holding at least 50. I go into the building mentioned and the address and call the phone number I was given to let them know I've arrived. Enter Chad. Chad comes to meet me and seems excited that I've come. He escorts me through the building to an office. Mind you, as far as I can see, we're the only two humans in the building. He gives me the pitch for the company, tells me he built the software being sold, but it's not scalable and he needs someone who can rewrite it. After we go through the whole interview song and dance, he offers me the job on the spot. The pay is marginally higher than the last gig, so I figure gas would be covered for the commute. I agree and we shake hands as I'm going to be starting the next Monday. Red flags start appearing from the very first minute I arrive on Monday. First, I'm given a tour, which consists of the 14 by 14 foot office I'm going to be sharing with Chad, as well as another engineer who's going to be starting the following Monday. I'm not a fan of having someone able to look over my shoulder. It makes me nervous. I ask why each engineer's desk has two computers because the one you will be writing code on doesn't have internet access for security purposes. Note, this was pure paranoia. There was nothing about this software that required such tight security. We weren't doing any government contracts or anything of the sort. Then I'm escorted clear across the building to meet with the CEO, Richard, and the IT guy, Eddie, and the sales support team. I'm told that half of the team is supporting the existing version of the application, two people are selling the existing version to new clients, or trying to, and one person is explicitly tasked with selling the new version, the one I haven't even started on yet. I'm still young and dumb at this point, but even I know this means the salesperson is probably giving out a date when the customers should expect their purchase to be filled. It's a good thing you started when you did. We've been telling customers it'll be ready in June. Did I mention all this was happening in February? Apparently, I've agreed to rewrite, test, and package an entire application I've never seen before in approximately four months. So, two are being done, I sit down and get to work. After jumping through a bunch of hoops of getting the software I prefer downloaded onto the actual work machine, as well as the code, I set about reviewing code so horrific I've not seen its like since, and there isn't a single comment in the entire thing. Before I can ask a single question of the CTO, however, he tells me he's headed to downtown LA to scalp his tickets to the Lakers game, and that he'll see me tomorrow. So, now I'm alone in the office with this abomination, a machine that's been hamstrung to heck and back, and the only thing I've got to console me is the fact that at least I'm employed again. Fast forward a week, I've documented the bulk of the code because there wasn't any, and the boss and I do not get along. He's mad because I've not written any substantial code, and I'm frustrated because I'm trying to understand a lot of what specific code is trying to do, and he's routinely leaving around noon to go sell his tickets for Lakers games, or just not in the office because he's chatting with someone else. When he is in the office, I show him my documentation and try to get him to verify it or describe the purpose of code where all I can say is, what? By the end of the week, I've covered about 30% of the project in a wiki-like document, and I've taken to leaving after sunset so I can A, get more done, B, have a shorter commute, and C, drive when my car isn't an oven, the AC didn't work. I've barely managed to convince the CTO that what I'm doing is necessary, so the engineer starting the next Monday doesn't have to do anywhere near the same crap I've got, which would make us a more efficient team. Monday arrives and in comes Big Bro. I call him this because he was a much more experienced engineer than I was. We spend the first day with him getting set up, then us reviewing what I've documented. 
He manages to answer some questions the CTO never did, just because he is that much better, and I start to feel more confident. Over the next weeks, Big Bro took me under his wing as an engineer, teaching me best practices, standards, and where my plans were good and where they could be better. If it hadn't been for him, I'd have gone insane. I end up joining him outside for smoke breaks, even though I don't smoke, just so I can get a breath of non-office air. He and I discuss the project, and we also make friends with Eddie, who makes us laugh by telling us horror stories about the CTO and CEO. Apparently, he was a school friend of theirs and basically worked with them because they paid him to do something he felt was super easy. April rolls around. I've got a special occasion I need the day off for, which happens to be a Wednesday that year. I'd advised him when I first started and he had been cool with it. I remind him on April 2nd, since I had an irrational fear of policy decisions being made on April Fool's Day, and he loses it. He goes off on a rant and straight up informs me that he regrets hiring me, claiming I didn't have the skills I told him I did and wasn't worth what I was being paid. We're definitely not halfway done, more like one third, and it's already been decided that June is a lost cause and that we're shooting for August now. That habit I started before of leaving after the sun went down? Yeah, that never stopped. I was arriving at 9 a.m. every day and leaving around 10 p.m. every night, trying my best. Big Bro was the same, and Eddie would stay late with us just because we liked hanging out together. So it should be understandable that I was very close to losing it right back at him. In a strained, yet diplomatic voice, I told him that if he put in the same amount of work to help us as we put in to rewrite his code, we'd probably be a lot closer to done than we are, especially given the 12-hour days. He was not a fan of that and switched to straight up yelling, blaming us for the lost sales and refunds due to the delays, and that the only way he'd get off of our backs was by getting the project done. This entire time, Big Bro is just sitting there and says nothing to back me up. Chad then left the office for a bit, and I just declared I was taking my lunch and would be back in an hour. I felt frustrated by Chad and betrayed by Big Bro, who I felt, rightly or not, should have had my back since we were in the same boat. When we were both back in the office, he apologized for yelling and told me that since he agreed when I was hired, I could have my day off. Cool, I apologized too, although not for anything specific. I just didn't want to talk to him anymore and figured that was the fastest way to end the conversation. Fast forward to June and the opportunity for malicious compliance. Over the last two months, Chad has been getting worse and worse. He's yelling nearly every day and still leaving early too. Big Bro and Eddie are also feeling the pain. Nobody is safe from his ego. The smoke breaks in afternoon slash evening portion of our day are when we're most productive as nobody can focus until Chad leaves. The first Monday in June rolls around and Chad invites me to go on a walk outside for a one-on-one -on -one meeting. I figured I'm being fired. At this point, we've had to refactor the rewrite almost entirely due to missing a critical chunk of functionality and we're still only 60% done. August release is looking less and less sure. Chad informs me that he's hired a third engineer, but in order to stay in the budget to pay me, he's cutting my salary in half. I stop on the spot and just give him a blank look. Are you serious? I ask. I'm barely able to pay for my bills and the gas required to commute here as it is. If you cut my salary at all, I won't be able to afford to live. At this point, the idea of cutting my productivity to help ramp up a new engineer so he can help us meet the deadlines doesn't even occur to me. Although in hindsight, that would also have been a pretty major issue. Chad brushes me off. That's not my problem. The fact that you missed one deadline and look like you're going to miss another is. If you've got a problem with that, you're more than welcome to go find another job. The new guy starts in two weeks. And with that, he walked inside. I had just been told that I had two weeks left of job at my current salary. Cool. So that day I do something I hadn't done since I first started. I left while the sun was still up. Specifically, I left at 5 p.m. I drive my oven car, no working air conditioning in a car that had been left in the sun all day, and Woodland Hills had me feeling like a baked potato. Through traffic, hour and a half commute home through LA heat, and updated my resume before reactivating my accounts on all the job sites. I'm contacted the next day by a potential new employer and I get an interview scheduled. I decide to tell Big Bro about the new opportunity and he hits me with news that lets me know just how small a world we live in. Me. Hey, Big Bro, just for your information, I've started looking for a new job. I've already got an interview lined up. Big Bro. Really? Where? Me. Over at this company. Big Bro. Wow, that's where I worked before I came here. That place is pretty awesome and I left there on pretty good terms. I know the CTO there. Go ahead and use me as a reference. 
Me, skeptical. Really? Okay. Turns out, Big Bro was true to his word, and the CTO and I even talked about Big Bro during the interview. Apparently, they had already talked about me, and Big Bro had been the ultimate hype man, confirming everything I said was why I was looking for a new job and everything. All goes well, and I'm electronically signing an offer letter that Friday afternoon. Chad had already left for the day, so there was nobody to look over my shoulder as I used the work computer that had internet access to get this done. At the new job, the commute is cut by more than half and comes with a pretty significant raise. I tell Big Bro and Eddie on the last smoke break, I still don't smoke, that I'm done and I found something new. Oddly enough, they both smile and just wish me luck. No hard feelings, hope we can stay in touch. Odd, but I'd stopped really caring about anything related to that job, so I paid it no mind. I went back inside, packed up my stuff into my backpack and walked to the CEO's office. Me. Hey, Richard, got a minute? Richard. Hey, OP, what's up? Me. Just wanted to let you know I found a new job, so I'm moving on. Richard. Really? Why? We need you. Me. You guys decided it was cool to cut my salary to a point where I couldn't afford to live. Chad said if I didn't like it, I should look for something new. So I did. Richard, looking defeated. Well, when's your last day? Me. Today. Richard, now upset. We need you here to train the new guy who starts soon. Hey, I had to train myself, and to an extent, Big Bro when he first started. The new guy should be able to as well. And with that, I left for greener pastures. The unexpectedly huge fallout. Four months later, Big Bro texts me to ask how things are going. I tell him things are great, and we schedule a lunchtime call, because apparently things have gone sideways in a huge way. Part 1. Apparently, Chad came in on Monday, almost violently angry, and demands Eddie re-image my work machine first thing in the morning, which erases everything I'd left on there. Big Bro comes in an hour late, and he and Chad discuss the new timeline for the project. Somewhere in there, apparently, Big Bro asks Chad to log into the admin account on my old work machine so he can pull the documents I'd accumulated about the planned architecture, the existing code, meeting notes, etc. Chad answers by apparently punching a hole in the wall and leaving for the day probably to go to the hospital to deal with his hand, at 10.30 in the morning. Big Bro then spends the rest of that week ostensibly working on recreating the documentation from scratch. Part 2. When I asked how the new guy handled the new documentation, Big Bro laughed and told me there never was any documentation. Apparently, he and Eddie had become really good friends in the months we worked there, to the point where they had become roommates about a month before I left. More than that though, they decided to start a freelance slash consulting business together and only had to decide on when to make that their full-time jobs. Neither of them liked Chad much and wanted to make their departure heard as much as possible. So they decide to make Big Bro's last day the day before the new guy starts and Eddie would quit shortly afterward, sticking around just long enough to watch the bomb go off. Did I mention Big Bro never told Chad he was quitting? Yeah, he just didn't show up that Monday. He had, however, emailed that documentation he had spent a week writing to Chad. Turns out he wasn't documenting the code at all. He had spent a week writing a letter explaining in excruciating detail why Chad was such a bad boss and he had emailed it to everyone in the company. I asked if he still had it so I could read it and he sent it to me after the call. Thankfully, like the big helper he was, Eddie had ensured that the new guy's email was set up and in the proper groups before the email was sent. So the guy's first email in the company was a novella about the kind of person he had agreed to work for. Apparently, Chad thought it was appropriate to take his frustration out on the new guy, who'd already read a significant portion of the email before Chad shoved him away from his desk and deleted it. Apparently, new guy promptly decided, and rightfully so, that agreeing to work for Chad had been a mistake, packed up his things, and quit on the spot. Part 3. With the new guy quitting, the August deadline was now little more than a dream within a dream, which, according to Eddie, doesn't stop Chad and Richard from trying to find that miracle rock star engineer who can save them from their own situation, which, given what they were offering as pay, didn't exist. So time advances in its unstoppable way. August arrives, and customers find that they've paid for something that hasn't been delivered yet, and pretty much unanimously demand refunds, with a few customers bringing legal action against them. With the amount they have to refund, and the money they now need for legal fees, because of the way they had incorporated, they were personally liable, they could no longer afford to pay anyone and were forced to shut their business. Have you ever had a boss demand impossible tasks from you? If so, what did you do about it? Please let us know. I'd probably just quit. Then again, I've never had a job.
Make me do all of the science project? I'll throw you under the bus. Cast. We've got Pathological Liar. We've got Sheep Boy. We've got Amazing Teacher. And me, as starting to salve. So, this story happened when I was in 7th grade. During that time, the school district had all students participate in a mandatory annual science fair from elementary school up to the end of middle school. The idea was to get students interested in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math fields, and occupations. After participating in science fairs for six years, I was used to the usual rigmarole that a science fair project entailed. I come up with some, hopefully unique, project ideas, most likely the very original electricity from a potato project. I make a hypothesis, collect data, pay the school or Home Depot 10 to $20 for a science fair board, tape up charts and diagrams to the board the night before presenting, and then rinse and repeat for the next year. However, this year my class was doing things a little differently. My class had the honor of being the first to be selected to participate in a virtual science fair. So basically, we were voluntold. No one in our section of the district at the time did a virtual science fair before, so we were signed up as guinea pigs to test it out. If that wasn't good enough, my class also had to promote healthy collaboration among students, so we were assigned to do projects in a group. Now, I hate group work. I always got the short end of the stick in a group. Either my group gets stuck with someone that skimps out on work and the other group members and I have to cover their portion, or everyone in the group except me avoids work like the plague, and no matter how much I urge them to participate, I eventually have to do all the work myself to maintain my precious grade. I was a straight A student at the time, so any group work assigned to me was a threat to my grade and my sanity. If I ever got less than an A on any assignment, my mother would ask me, why didn't you get an A? Sonny boy, do you need help at school? It drove me insane since I wasn't failing. Anyways, the online science fair was pretty simple. As a group, we were assigned access to a group science fair board that we could fill out with our results, figures, hypothesis, etc. We were to have certain parts of the project, like the discussion done, by particular dates to get points towards our grade. The overall project was due in two months, and then we were to give a presentation. Amazing teacher was brilliant. She wanted us to record our project progress in a composition book in tandem with the online portion, which she would review during our presentation in two months. I believe this was to help us keep track of notes in case we forgot to log them into the computer later, but it was used by me as a tool in my revenge. I was paired with Pathological Liar and Sheep Boy, who I was kind of friends with. We brainstormed and settled on testing the performance of an individual in exercise before and after they drink an energy drink. This was in part influenced by Monster Energy Drink just becoming popular and Sheep Boy's parents getting a new home gym. I thought it was great since I was playing football at the time and wanted to work out more. Also, Pathological Liar, Sheep Boy and I literally shared every class together and lived within a mile of each other so it would be super easy to communicate. However, Sheep Boy and Pathological Liar never seemed to want to talk about the project. After two weeks of radio silence from Liar and Sheep Boy, I finally corralled them in one place and suggested we meet up at Sheep Boy's house that weekend to start the project. On the day of the meetup, Sheep Boy's mom had to go grocery shopping or something, so Sheep Boy was out. Undaunted, I told Pathological Liar it would be fine if we work at my house and researched other studies on it to get the ball rolling. But Liar never showed up that day, so I decided to confront him on our walk home from school the next day. Oh my god, if you heard what came out of this boy's mouth as an excuse. While we were literally within spitting distance of my house, Liar said he couldn't come over yesterday or today because his grandparents had got into a plane crash. I was flabbergasted and exclaimed, what, really? But I didn't see anything on the news about a plane crash. Pathological Liar responded indignantly. Plane crashes happen all the time, starting to salve. They're not all going to get reported on. Their plane struck another plane on the tarmac and then rolled over and snapped off both wings. Me, insert surprised Pikachu face. OMG, I'm so sorry. Did they get hurt? Liar. What? No, why would they, idiot? Anyways, I can't do the project this week. See ya. This little jerk then ran home. After I got home and deduced that he had just fed me a sack of lies, I just said whatever and filled out the preliminary sections of the project and wrote notes in the composition book to at least ensure we had something to turn in next week. I was willing to give the group a second chance because maybe their busy middle school lives were swamped. After another two weeks of attempting to coordinate my group and getting them to at least contribute a page or two to the report, 
we finally decided to meet up at Sheep Boy's house again to start collecting the data. We actually all showed up this time, and Sheep Boy's mom had bought the monster energy drinks we needed. Pathological Liar started to guzzle them because he wanted to test out the drinks first. Sheep Boy showed off his new home gym and then got us to play Smash Brothers for half an hour. I didn't want to play at first, but then decided to lighten up and we could do the tests afterward. After coaxing my group back to the gym, Pathological Liar just rambled and chit-chatted. Me, trying to be pragmatic, said, Hey guys, why don't we start our exercise now and record some data, and then afterward I can school y'all in Smash Brothers. Sheep Boy looked willing until Liar sighed out. Oh my god, starting to sigh. <sighs> we didn't invite you out to do this stupid project, we invited you to hang out. Sheep Boy's attitude did a complete 180, chiming in. Yeah, we don't want to do this stupid project now. I was seething. Pathological Liar spouted a load of bull. This wasn't even his house. I was the one who organized this get-together to collect science data for the fair. I was the one herding these sheeple around. OMG. The second chance I gave them was taken and then stomped all over the ground and they weren't getting a third one. I relented and said, Okay then, let's just hang out then. When I got home that night, I was angry and I used that anger to fuel my revenge. I conscripted my parents to the science fair project and they helped me collect the data I needed by volunteering to work out and drink energy drinks. The data collection problem was solved. Once I got enough data, I wrote down everything for the science fair project in the composition book. I even uploaded everything to the online science fair board. I created all the PowerPoint slides and scripts for the presentation. Over the next few weeks leading up to the presentation, Sheep Boy and Liar didn't even ask about the science fair project. They had no intention of doing any of the work. Although my anger fueled me to get the project done, I wasn't finished. I did the pettiest thing I could think of and signed a corner of the composition book with Starting to Sav did all the work. I knew that Amazing Teacher would be checking our composition books while we were presenting the project and I couldn't wait to see how Liar would try to weasel his way out of this one. On the day of the presentation, Liar and Sheep Boy were nervously fidgeting at their desks because they didn't have anything prepared. I strolled in and told them to relax since I made a PowerPoint. They relaxed, not knowing how stupid they were going to look while presenting. Oh, how dumb they looked when we started presenting to the whole class. I had already memorized the slides and my script and was effortlessly strolling around the room, making eye contact and delivering a great speech on the science fair project. Liar and Sheep Boy just read off the slides with deadpan expressions with their hands in their pants and not moving an inch. I was relishing this, all the while gleefully peeking at the back of the classroom where Amazing Teacher was reading through our composition book. Amazing Teacher would stop our presentation every once in a while to ask questions and compare with what was written down in the book. But once the bomb dropped, my blood ran cool with maniacal glee. I saw Awesome Teacher stop and read a corner of the book. She then read it out loud. Starting to salve did all of the work? I felt Pathological Liar and Sheep Boy grow cold next to me. Pathological Liar, that cunning fox, stammered out. Well, yeah, he worked on that section, miss. Amazing Teacher brought her glasses down to the tip of her nose and stared at Pathological Liar over the rims and coolly stated, So you're telling me that Starting to Sav was just signing his part of the composition book and that you all wrote in here equally? Liar. Yes, ma'am. Me, shrugs. At this point, I wavered. I didn't want to feel the social wrath from them or their friends for stepping out and challenging Pathological Liar's lie, so I stayed silent. At least I embarrassed them for a moment. After my crowning achievement of embarrassing Liar and Sheep Boy, I thought nothing would really come from it, but boy was I wrong. After grades were released for the project, I was totally bummed out that I got a 96. It wasn't the perfect A that I was hoping for, and I knew my mother would be asking me, why didn't you get an A+, why didn't you get a 100? But then Sheep Boy and Pathological Liar ran up to me with their eyes wide with terror, asking, what did you get for your grade? Me, I got a grade, why? This is how I snarkily avoided answering questions on my grade. Liar. Sheep Boy got a 66, and I got a 48. I was shocked to hear that, and then I figured out that Amazing Teacher must have interrogated my groupmates on the project separately and awarded them the grades they deserved. OMG, my petty revenge tanked their grades. The Science Fair project alone was 25% of our total grade that year. I was so grateful that Amazing Teacher saw my frustration and punished them. Did you like group projects in school or not? Please let us know. 
I could never stand them, to be honest. Just married? Mother shall come stay. Mother dearest is insane. It was a bit of a ride when I got married. Husband is British, I'm Australian, and we live in England. Hence, all my loving and crazy family came from Oz for the big day. I'm one of four kids, and my family are breeders, whereas husband's family is small and significantly less crazy. They all came in dribs and drabs for our December wedding, leaving the warm tropical Aussie climate for negative 3 Celsius and December snow. Key information is that my mom buzzed off when I was three because she was tired of being a mom, so I was raised by the barrel-chested, swearing, but adorable pirate that is my father. Mother has the emotional maturity of a toddler and genuinely believes the world and her children adore her. We do not. Back to the wedding and the BS she pulled. We had organized events for the Australian contingent for the two weeks before the wedding, but not much for after as we were going to be newly married. I don't think I need to expand because most people understand that newlyweds generally want to spend time together. She arrived three weeks before the wedding and is annoyed that she is staying, for free, at my husband's parents' house, where my brother and his wife and daughter were also staying. She wanted to stay at my house, like my sister, who was my maid of honor. This was obviously ignored as she stresses me out, so she sat in the garden of my in-law's house and pouted like a child until we left, then made passive-aggressive posts on Facebook about being ignored and unloved after traveling so far, which I pettily laughed at because not a single person commented. Wedding day arrived. I wrote on an old account about her actions on the day before and day of our wedding. Namely, she tried to get back with my dad, who is definitely not interested, and then wore pajamas to our wedding reception. But it is what happened after that just irks me. She'd been staying with my in-laws for three weeks. She knew husband and I were going on our honeymoon the weekend after the wedding. She then asked the day after we were married for the keys to our house as she was going to house sit while we were away. You what now? No, you are not accessing my house when I am not there. She then cries about how she booked to come to England for eight weeks because otherwise the cost of the tickets wasn't worth it. Again, what? All my other family had left the week after the wedding, except my brother and his wife, who instead traveled to London to see friends, but they were still not coming back to see me. I point blank told her that she wasn't coming to my house while I wasn't there. Did I mention I got married in December? So Christmas is around the corner. She plays the family card about how she has never spent a Christmas with me and she will stay in a hotel but just wants to be with me on the day. I okay this. This is acceptable. Well done on doing a reasonable and rational thing, mother. But I did point out to her that the reason we didn't spend Christmas together was because she chose to buzz off on a yacht, so it's on her. You know what wasn't acceptable? The day we got back from our honeymoon, she rocked up at the house and didn't leave for two weeks. Just what every husband wants on their return from their honeymoon. The world's most entitled and awful mother-in-law crashing their house and leaving fertility candles all over the joint while saying we are jerks because we won't talk about our private lives with her. She joined us at my in-law's house for Christmas. It started fine until on Christmas Eve I got a major case of stomach flu and started throwing up every 20 minutes. The first time I was sick, my mother-in-law rushed to the bathroom with water, a cool compress for my head and made sure I was okay. My own mother didn't get up from the sofa. I spent Christmas Day in bed, in agony with horrible cramps and regularly throwing up. My mother-in-law and husband took it in turns to check on me and keep me company. My mother only came to see me once, after Christmas dinner, to complain that my mother-in-law gave my husband the Yorkshire pudding that had been made for me, when she, as the real guest, should have been offered it. If I had been able to throw up on her, I would have. But sadly, I was just painfully retching at that point. I feel for my husband, I truly do. The poor man hid in our bedroom for two weeks, only venturing out when I told him the coast was clear. No stars, do not recommend. Have you ever had someone stay at your house who you just couldn't stand? If so, what was wrong with them? Please let us know. Yeah, you Reddit boy. You want your money back on an item that's selling for 10 times what you paid for it? Sounds good. I run an anime slash geek store and we are really lenient with pre-orders. We used to not require a deposit to make an order and in case you needed more time to pick up an item, all you had to do was ask. We could also hold the items for as long as needed in our storage if you wanted to gather a lot of items so you could save on trips and shipping. Back in February, Funko released a special edition vinyl pop of Naruto Hokaji. 
This one in particular had a 1 in 6 chase variant that ended reaching up to a resale value of $130. But the way I do pre-orders is that if you order 6 of the same price, you are guaranteed a chase. But if you only order 1, you still get a 1 in 6 chance of getting the chase. I just mix them up in random boxes and do a public stream raffle on social media so everyone knows who won the chase. And I get good publicity that way. A client ordered just one and left $5 as a deposit. The piece was $15. This particular client won the raffle, along several other clients, but he wasn't that interested in picking it up or paying for the rest of it. I sent him a message letting him know that he won the special variant and had a week to pay for it or he will lose his pre-order. At first, he was angry because he wanted the normal version, not this yellow thing, but we explained he could change it if he wanted, but that this one was far more valuable. He said he asked his son and his son wanted it anyway, but asked for more time to pay, so we gave him one more week. Then he asked for another week and another. Then we had to close the store for a time for, you know, 2020 reasons, and we told him we had to close, but we could still schedule an appointment to give him his item or wait until the worst passed. He never answered. Eventually, we were able to reopen the store with regulations in place and send him another message telling him we can save it for as long as needed in these strange times. He still didn't answer the messages, but at this point, he arrived at the store and demanded for his money back, citing how we were in the middle of what was going on. Fair. And he couldn't waste money on frivolous plastic. Also fair. I asked him if he was sure and even showed him the price the figure was selling for. At that point in time, the chase figure was selling closer to $150 and he just had to pay retail price for it, so about $10 more for it. He said he was sure I had made up the numbers, that he had ordered the figure for his son, but he didn't deserve it, harsh, and just wanted, no, demanded his money back. I just said, fine, I'll give you your money back. Also, I'll just put this figure out for sale. He just said, whatever, just give me my money. I made a point to grab a post-it note that I used to put prices to not damage the box. Write in big black letters, 90 bucks, last one, and put it on the glass window that leads to the street. I could see him turn his eyes while I did this. While my employee was giving him his five bucks back and giving him a receipt, a young man knocked on the door. I gave him some cleaning goo, checked his temperature, and let him in. He immediately asked to buy the Naruto chase figure. The angry man's eyes went wide open over his mask as I picked the pop and guided the young man to the desk, where he handed me the bills one by one. The angry man stood there, shocked as the younger man was gushing about how hard it was to get that figure, and how he was getting it for half the price the other places were asking, and in such perfect condition too. I couldn't have had a better reaction even if I paid him for it. The young man completed his purchase and leaved as fast as he came. The angry man looked at me, almost as if accusing me of taking advantage of him. I just said, well, you got your money back. I'm happy you are happy. If you need anything else, please let me know and stay safe out there. The man just didn't have much else to say and left. Kind of a small and silly thing to feel good about, but 2020 hit us so hard that any unexpected profit was cause for celebration. So we celebrated that good sale with some instant ramen, Naruto style. Edit. Thanks for all the kind words. My store is in Mexico and I really appreciate everyone asking me how to support it. I didn't mean to self-promote, and I'm not 100% sure if it's against the rules, so I won't. And also, I can't ship to the US right now due to the situation. I'm not American, so I can't cross the border since I'm not essential. Also, I'm trying to go out as little as possible. I want to answer all of you directly, but I just can't. Speaking of Funko Pops, do you have any Funko Pops? If so, which ones? Please let us know. I want a Mr. Reddit Funko Pop so that I can burn it. Am I the jerk for refusing to just skip a day of my commitment to 20,000 steps a day just to prove something to my sister-in-law? Five years ago, I made a commitment to get at least 20,000 steps every day, and I've stuck to it every day. It hasn't been easy, but it's something that really felt important to me. I was overweight and stuck in a very sedentary lifestyle and mindset. Making the commitment forced me to get off my butt taking long walks, and then picking up running, and overall being mindful of no longer being a lazy person. I've slimmed down, and am overall much happier and healthier than I was, physically and especially mentally. Other side effects are that my home is cleaner, I know more of my neighbors, I've seen a lot of great street art, etc. It's not something that really impacts my day beyond making sure I have the time, 
but for some reason, it really, really upsets my sister-in-law. I don't make a big deal yelling, gotta get my steps in every day. Hey everyone, my steps, getting them, or anything. We were at the park with her kids. She asked me if I was still doing that silly step thing, and I said yeah, I felt pretty good about it. She said that she worries about me and how obsessive I am about it. I told her that I don't think I'm obsessive, that it's just a part of my daily routine, like taking a shower or cleaning up. Well, she got all weird and started saying, I bet you can't give it up for just one day. Just one day. See? You're addicted. It's an obsession. It's unhealthy. I told her that I'm not addicted. Again, the same way I'm not addicted to taking a shower or brushing my teeth. It's just a part of my lifestyle now, that I'm not going to give up and break my streak just to prove a point. That would be ridiculous. I suggested maybe she could join me and try it for a few days, and she went off saying that I was calling her overweight. She went around pestering everyone in the family to challenge myself by taking a day off. She switched her tune and is now trying to guilt me by telling me it's setting a bad, unrealistic expectation for my nieces and nephews. I think that's ridiculous, and obviously if I'm doing it, it's not unrealistic. Her biggest complaint is that for the past few holiday meals we've had together, I make a big show of getting up and taking a walk afterwards, like I'm trying to prove something to someone. I told her that it's pretty common and that some families go on runs together in the morning of Thanksgiving or take a hike. She told me that I was effectively shaming everyone because they wanted to relax. I think that's ridiculous, but she insists that it's insulting to everyone and makes me an obsessed jerk. Am I the jerk? I think it's worth adding that my sister-in-law isn't overweight. At least, I don't see her as overweight or anything. Also, I don't have an eating disorder and I'm not replacing one addiction with another, so please stop projecting that onto me. You people are trying to come up with these insane hypotheticals to try to gotcha me because for some reason you want me to have an eating disorder. So let me clarify one last time and I won't be acknowledging any comments insinuating that I need to reflect or whatever. I do not have an eating disorder, I do not have an exercise addiction. So now that we have that out of the way, okay, you guys cannot listen. I'm logging out. Instead of engaging with me in good faith, you're continuing to try to wrangle me into some scenario where you think I have an eating disorder or exercise addiction. I said multiple times that these are not the issues. Now, why would I continue to say that? Because I have a therapist and we have already gone over this. Well, who do you agree with? OP or her sister-in-law? Please let us know. Her sister-in-law just needs to mind her own business. But your lunch special used to cost $5. I was reminded of this funny story when I was talking to a friend about people that are ridiculous. Oh, and here's some backstory. I'm Chinese, 13, male, and I sometimes help out my parents at a Chinese restaurant they own. The important part is that they bought the place from a different couple, I think like 10 years ago. Keep that in mind. Also, this is in the summer of 2020, so lockdown is still rampant. Okay, on to the story. It's a normal day and I'm just helping out, taking customers' orders, cleaning, etc. A guy walks to the screen we have set up because of lockdown and orders a lunch special. A lunch special is basically almost any meal with fried rice and either a soda, egg roll, or soup the customer chooses. I don't remember exactly what he ordered, but it's not too important. I ring him up and the total is $8. Now, the lunch special used to be $7.45, but because we weren't getting as much business as before, my parents raised the price to $8. Most people don't mind paying an extra 55 cents. I don't know if anyone else does this, but my parents did. The characters are me and the customer. Me. Okay, that'll be $8. Customer. Wait, what? I don't remember exactly what was said. Me. Um, it'll be $8. Now wait just one second. I thought your special was $5. Me. Uh, that might have been from years ago. Maybe the old owners had the price at $5, but it's $8 now. Well, this is ridiculous. You can't charge me $8. It's five. Me. Sir, I'm not sure what to tell you. The menu says it's $8. Fine. I'll show you a real menu that says it's five. At this point, I'm really confused. Me. Okay. Customer huffs and stalks away. I saw him get into his car and drive away, which didn't bother me because maybe it's at home. I tell my mother and she laughs. I wait 10 minutes. Nothing. 15 minutes. Still no sign. After 30 minutes, I guess this guy went home and was mad I didn't charge him $3 less. My parents just thought he was an idiot. There you have it. The time a guy wanted to be a Karen and just made a fool of himself. 
He didn't even get his food. I have a lot more stories, so let me know if I should share them. Am I the jerk for telling my husband and his family to suck it up when they complained about my daughter's wedding? I won't complicate this. I have a daughter, Kara, who is not my biological daughter, nor was she my legal daughter until she reached the age of 18 when she asked me to adopt her as an adult. I married my husband when she was 14 and together we have two kids. Kara gets along okay with my husband, but admittedly her upbringing means she was maybe not as able to bond with a father figure as she was with a mother figure and her age was also a factor. Regardless, everyone gets along and I think that is the best you expect when you have someone who went through as much as she did at a young age. Kara is engaged and came to me recently and told me she would like to walk with me down the aisle and do a dance with me while her fiancé dances with his mom. She told me she didn't know how to ask for that without hurting my husband. I told her he would understand and I would be honored to do it. I did not expect my husband and his parents to take offense. They believe she snubbed my husband and is making it seem like he's nothing. After listening to them complain about this for 10 minutes, I told them to suck it up and accept that she asked me, her mom, to do both of these parts of the wedding and that I was proud to do it. I dared them to tell me I was less deserving than my husband. My husband and his parents believe I wasn't very understanding and downright rude, according to my mother-in-law. Am I the jerk? So, to clarify for people because I was not clear, my husband is not her father. He is her stepfather through me. I was married before and she was my stepdaughter, who I ended up with custody of but never legally adopted as a minor because her biological mother was alive. I did adopt her when she turned 18. Not my husband, just me. Adding some more to this, had my husband confided in me that his feelings were hurt, that would be one thing, but he did not. He went to his parents and then all three decided to take offense to the fact not only was he not asked, but I was. And while they never came out directly and told me that I should say no, it was implied throughout their complaints. None of which were about his hurt feelings and all about the snub and how unbelievable it was that I would be filling that role in her wedding. Well, who do you agree with? OP or her in-laws? Please let us know. Maybe those in-laws need to mind their own business. Why can't anyone mind their own business? Lady attempted to spit on me. A few months ago, around the end of November, beginning of December, a woman walks into the girl's clothing store I worked at. Now, the store I worked at recently closed due to being bought out. A lot of people were mad about that, yelling at the employees and demanding explanation. I wasn't a manager or anything, so I didn't really know much, just what I was told. So all I knew was that any purchases made after November 12th were final sale, no returns or exchanges. The registers are also set up where we have signs saying all sales are final and we have plexiglass between the cashier and customer. This lady came into the store and she looked pretty put together and wealthy. She was wearing form-fitting jeans, a sweater, and had nice makeup on. In my area, we require masks or face shields, so she had a face shield on. It comes into play later. She also had two girls with her, probably nine and five. Both of them were also nicely dressed. She walked around for a bit before finally choosing a set of PJs. She walked up to my register and paid for her things, with me telling her two times verbally that all sales were final. We tell them all sales are final before they pay and again when we mark their receipt final sale. She acknowledged me, paid, and went to walk out of the store. On her way out, she stopped and looked at the PJs again. She seemed to find another set she liked, so she walked back up to the register. I took her at my register, assuming she wanted to buy the other set, but she slammed the bag of purchased PJs and the other set on the counter and said, I want to exchange these. I looked at her and said, I'm sorry ma'am, but all sales are final, so I'm unable to do that. She didn't like that answer and started saying, I didn't even leave the store. I just bought these. Do it. I explained to her again that I'm unable to do that. We didn't even have the option on the register anymore. She got more and more visibly aggravated with me. She kept demanding that I exchange the items using so many different excuses like, I just bought them, they are the same price, I didn't even leave, you didn't even tell me it's final sale, etc. Keep in mind, there are signs all over the store saying final sale, and I told her two times. I kept telling her over and over that I couldn't exchange them, but would be happy to ring it up in a separate purchase for her. She wasn't having it. She eventually slid her face shield up and spit in my direction. It landed on the plexiglass and not on me, but at that point, I wasn't taking it anymore. I'm not sure if she knew the plexiglass was there or not, but either way, I was done. 
I called my manager over and calmly explained the situation to her before stepping back. Now, my manager is very mama bear type. If someone messes with her employees, she doesn't take it. She took one look at the customer and said, You have five seconds to leave the store or I'm calling security to come in here and drag you out. The customer was taken aback for a bit, but eventually grabbed the PJ she purchased and stormed out. Her daughters just looked scared and embarrassed of their mom the whole time. The store closed shortly after that, so I'm not sure if anything ever came of it. But let's just say, I'm glad I don't work retail anymore. Am I the jerk for not letting my sister use my pool after she and her kids insulted my family? I, 28, female, am a mother of two and engaged to my partner of five years, 30, male. My kids are three and five years old and neither of them are my partner's children. I am four months pregnant with a third baby who is his biological kid. There was never any cheating and everyone involved is aware of all of this. When we started talking about moving in together, we agreed that we would move in with him and he put me on the deed, meaning we have equal equity in the house despite me paying a fraction of what he did. My siblings and I grew up poor and I only met my partner and got to the point I'm at because I got a combination of scholarships and grants for his university. All of this has given my siblings a lot to tease me over. I don't mind it most of the time, but there have been times I've had to shut it down. My sister, 36, female, has two kids, ages 4 and 6, with her husband. She and her husband were a few hours away, but last year they moved near us. With lockdown, I suggested that she bring her kids over to use our indoor pool. All four kids got on well, and my sister and I got to talk, so the arrangement was working. Additionally, the 4-year-old has a knee thing, which means the best thing for him is swimming, so this had considerable health benefits for him. Then, just before Christmas, they came over. I made my partner a drink and brought it to him, and she made a snarky comment about me being his maid. This led to a passive-aggressive conversation about our income and lifestyle, and the visit was cut short. Then, she brought her kids over again earlier this month. I don't know what happened exactly, but my kids came up to me, sobbing, saying their cousins called them jerks, and me a gold digger. My sister was with me, and she said her kids were just joking. I asked her where they learned those jokes, and she said they probably figured it out themselves. I said that even if that was the case, which I doubt, they should still apologize to my kids. She responded that they were only teasing, and I said they were being brats, and I expect an apology. My sister got them to apologize and left. Considering that this was the visit following the one where my sister and I had that passive-aggressive conversation about my income, I am confident that they did not figure it out themselves, rather that my sister either said it within their earshot or to them directly and they copied her. She's now calling me asking to use the pool. I've said no. I'm fine with my siblings teasing me, as we're all adults, but her kids calling my kids names, joking or not, was unacceptable. She said her kids were only joking. They've apologized and they really enjoy coming to my house and it's helping the four-year-old. I said they shouldn't be praised for apologizing. And after this, I don't think I want to put my kids in that position again. She said that I was being a selfish, privileged jerk by punishing her kids for something they've already apologized for and accused me of thinking I was better than her and our other siblings. I said that if she respected anything about my life, we would not be having these issues. And she said I was blowing this out of proportion and being a complete jerk by holding this over them and being willing to affect the four-year-old's health. I'm concerned that I'm in the wrong due to the four-year-old's health issues and the fact that the kids apologized and this was a first offense, so I feel I should give them some leeway. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or is her sister? Please let us know. We all know where her kids heard that from. I wouldn't allow them to my house at all. Help me find this item. Ma'am, I quit a week ago. This story takes place at the Mart of Walls, Blue and Yellow Sun Store. I had just quit my job there a week prior because I had been offered another job elsewhere. I had been planning on handing in my two-week notice when I quit, but someone was being so unbelievably rude that I quit on the spot, but that's a different story. Either way, the point is I was no longer an employee. I had to get some groceries, and because their prices were pretty good for what I needed, I went in. I'm pretty sure we all know what their employees wear, either a blue or yellow vest. I was wearing a black hoodie and a Guns N' Roses shirt, as well as shredded black jeans and Doc Martens. I looked nothing like an employee. I had my very expensive headphones on and went straight to the aisle with the candy. I had to bend down to tie my boots and grab something from the bottom shelf when someone starts talking behind me. I just kind of keep looking at the shelf when I feel someone grab my hoodie. Unsurprisingly, I stand up and there is a Karen standing behind me. I've been trying to get your attention for 10 minutes now. 
Note, I hadn't been standing there five minutes. I need you to help me grab something from the shelf over there, Karen said loudly, gesturing to the baby section. I am now grumpy. I don't like to be touched because I am very autistic and I have PTSD due to a very bad relationship. Worse than that though, she's keeping me from my candy. I look her straight in the eyes. I stare deep into her soul. She becomes visibly uncomfortable. I should mention that I was raised in a military family and I have zero fear of people like her. I haven't worked here for a week. It's obvious by the clothes I'm wearing that I don't work here. I would strongly recommend that you leave me alone because the next time you touch me, you'll regret it. She very briskly walks to get management. I find what I was looking for and head for the registers. Karen is up talking to the shift manager who was a friend of mine. She points to me and is obviously lying about what happened. The shift manager is trying so hard not to laugh at this point. Karen turns around in a huff and leaves. As I was walking out, I stopped by the returns desk to say, Hi. He gave me the biggest smile and just said, Live the dream, dude. Not the most dramatic, but yeah. Am I the jerk for leaving my sister at home when it was time to go to school? This happened a few months ago, but it's still a point of argument today. I, 16, female, have a 14-year-old sister. I have my own car, and since we both attend the same high school, I'm expected to take her to school with me. My sister, great as she is, has absolutely no sense of urgency when it comes to being on time. She'll deliberately refuse to get out of bed in the morning, takes half an hour minimum to do her hair, and spends so much time primping that she forgets to do necessary things like packing her lunch or taking her medication. I have to go out of my way to wake her up several times in the morning because she refuses to use her alarm and has broken several alarm clocks by throwing them across the room when they go off. I, on the other hand, am annoyingly punctual and it stresses me out to no end when I'm late because of her. Every single time I've been late this year has been because of her. I'll spend several minutes sitting in my car waiting for her before she comes running out only to remember that she forgot something and will spend more time looking. I've been late a total of six times and end up cutting it close almost every day. My school has a policy that eight tardies and one quarter gives an automatic three-day suspension. Despite constantly trying to talk to her about it and express that I need her to be on time, she hasn't made any effort. My parents are no help. One day I was waiting in my car for her, nervously tapping my foot and waiting while she dallied. I, looking at the clock, realized I'd have to leave right away to be able to make it on time and decided I'd had enough. I backed out of the driveway and left without her. About 20 minutes later, I got calls from both her and my parents. My mom and sister were furious that I had left her at home and that my mom had to give her a ride. My dad said that he thought it was hilarious and supported me in leaving her. I thought it was totally fair. This way, my sister had to face the consequences of her actions without dragging me down with her. However, many of my friends and family are adamant that it was a jerk move. Am I the jerk? Edit for correction. Thanks to all the positive words. Just wanted to get one thing straight. My sister does not have ADHD. She has an unrelated medical condition that leads to her taking medication in the morning. She's gone through screening for other things before, so we're positive she doesn't have it. It's simply her mindset. Well, what would you do? Would you leave without her? Or would you keep being late because of her? Please let us know. Karen tries to kick me out of my own apartment. I'm a 28-year-old male, and I've been friends with my roommate, 25, female, ever since we were babies. Our families were neighbors and we grew up together. She's like a little sister to me and has always been. After she graduated college, she moved to the same city I currently work in. And since she couldn't find an apartment close enough to where she worked, I told her she could live with me. We had share bills and become roommates. We never really had problems or fights as we've known each other for so long. However, recently things have taken a strange turn. She got involved with someone from her work. The guy seemed to be a nice guy. I only ever spoke to him three times and they usually keep to her room. But he was very friendly and honestly I was happy she found someone who seemed that nice. After a few months of their relationship, she sent me a text saying she needed to talk with me. I figured there might be something wrong with the apartment. It's not uncommon for things to break. But I was wrong. When I got home, we started talking. It's too long to write everything, so I'll just summarize. She told me that while she enjoyed living with me, her boyfriend was starting to get jealous of his woman living with another man. At first, I raised an eyebrow, but thought that this kind of thing isn't uncommon. So I was like, oh, it's fine. Just let me know when you plan on leaving. Hope you two find a good place. However, apparently I was wrong. She told me that she wasn't leaving. She said that it was impossible to find someone closer to her work and that she was hoping I would let her take the apartment instead 
since my work wasn't close and all that. Thing is, I really love my place. It's close to the gym, to the grocery store, to pretty much everything. I'm not going to just leave my place because of something so stupid as this. And I told her that flat out I was not going to leave. She got visibly upset and started to rant about me being egotistical and a jerk. That I didn't have empathy to put myself in her shoes. This happened a few days ago and she shut herself in her room and only ever leaves to go to work or to pick up her boyfriend, who became really unfriendly to me after that. Now, usually I can be a jerk, but I don't think this was one of those times. So I thought I would ask Reddit for your verdict. Am I really such a jerk? Edit. I didn't expect this to get this much attention. For those who have asked, her name isn't on the lease as I lived in the same place for two years before she moved in. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his roommate? Please let us know. I'd kick her out ASAP. She reminds me of my younger self. Don't want to fix my IT issue? Well, I think it's time for a new CTO. I just want to state that this IT issue is going to blow some people's minds. The security flaw that this presented was nothing short of incredible, and the fact that we never had a major security breach is astounding. It truly is. The flaw, you may ask? Everyone in the entire company's password was the same password. Yes, folks, you read that right. Every single password to every single employee login was the same password. It was like this before I joined the company and for quite a few years after. Until, well, enjoy the story. Now, what about the username? That must have been the trick, right? Oh yeah, that was a trick. The username was the employee email address. I did point out this flaw to my management and their response was, that's not our area to be concerned about. So whatever, it paid well, I'll do my job. And then one day, we had a Windows update, which caused a piece of the software I used to work to break. I submitted a help ticket, and after escalating the issue, I got to the CTO. It wasn't a huge company. The CTO said, I don't want to spend the time fixing this. Use this workaround. To which I pointed out, the workaround slows things down, makes my job harder, and this Windows update has to affect more than just me. I was told to suck it up. Now, at the time, the CEO was the son of the founder and a bit of a jerk. I legit feel at this point in time, he was just collecting a paycheck and letting everything run on auto and didn't pay attention. But I was mad at the CTO for brushing me off, so I pinned an email to the CEO. It was a short email and I simply said, I discovered a massive security flaw that could potentially expose us to huge liabilities. When would be a good time to discuss this? The response, what security flaw? I decided to demonstrate the flaw. I picked two random salespeople, I didn't know them. I got their username and I logged into their systems. And I pulled two random customers' personal information, the kind of information that would have easily allowed me to commit identity fraud, pull out credit in their names, etc. All kinds of bad stuff. I emailed the CEO and I explained, anyone who knows the URL to log into our system can log into anyone's account, pull up customers' information, and everyone has the same password. To prove this, I logged into two employees' random accounts and pulled two different customer profiles and I've attached them. One single disgruntled employee could do us over. 25 minutes later, my phone rings. It's the CEO. He was nice, very interested in how I did this. This guy isn't the sharpest knife in the drawer. And I pointed out the flaw in plain English and the liability that it presents to him. I walked him through the process of hacking my own account as he called it. I'd hate to call it hacking because it was easy. Now it dawned on this CEO that this liability was huge. I pointed out again in our conversation a single upset employee could destroy us. The fact that it hadn't happened already was nothing short of a miracle. I get told that they want me to present this to the executive team so they can discuss a solution. Honestly, the solution is obvious. So a day later we have the conference call. It's the CEO, the CTO, COO, CFO, the company lawyer, the senior VP, etc. And on the call, I demonstrate the flaw and I lay out how I, as a lay person with very little IT background, was able to figure this out. It's incredible that we have this flaw. Everyone is in agreement that this is a huge issue, except the CTO. The CTO gets very upset at me and he wants me fired for hacking the system. He says that per our employee handbook, what I did is a fireable offense. I point out that I'm not abusing this loophole 
and I'm only doing it to expose the flaw because I care about the company, and I think this is something that needs to be brought forward. I point out that a former disgruntled employee could log into an account and steal customers' personal information, and if that were traced back to us, the liability would be huge. I could tell our corporate attorney agreed with me, and he was shocked at what I was demonstrating. The CTO pointed out that former employees' usernames are disabled, to which I pointed out every employee username is their email address. It would be trivial for a former disgruntled employee to use a different employee email address that they remember to log in, and since everyone's password is the same, they don't even have to guess. The CTO points out that we would know who did it because of the IP address. I pointed out that VPNs are indeed a thing. The corporate attorney actually wasn't familiar with what VPNs do and I explained it. And what shocked me is the whole time, the only person in the meeting who didn't agree this flaw needs to be changed was the CTO. The CEO made it clear that this issue would be fixed by the end of business that day and there were no ifs and buts about it. The meeting ended. After the meeting, the CTO called me. Privately, he was mad. I just exposed his incompetence because the system was his design. The decision for everyone to have the same password was his decision, and I know why he did it. He did it because he was lazy. And I said to the CTO, You're a crappy CTO. You shouldn't be in the position you are, and you're lazy. You should have found a better solution for my help ticket. He stops and asks, So this is about your stupid help ticket? I go, yes, yes it is. He laughs and says he's going to have me fired. And I laugh and go, I'm pretty sure someone is getting fired. I'm also super confident that it's not going to be me. Well, sure enough, later that day, we got an email stating that everyone was to change their passwords to something unique. A week later, the CEO announced the old CTO stepped down to spend more time with his family. On the first day of the new CTO tenure, he sent me an email telling me he wanted to personally work on my help ticket and find a solution around the whole Windows update, which I'm pleased to say he did. And I later had conversations with our attorney at a meeting. We legit never had a security breach, which is simply astounding. The attorney admitted that was just plain dumb luck on our part, and if we would have had a security breach, it would have been very bad for us. Your aura is ugly. We would like a new server. Okay, hi friends. Long time server, but my first post in here. I work at an upscale-ish restaurant. We have two floors, and last night I was serving upstairs, and because of the obvious restrictions and whatnot, we only have hosts downstairs. When we are on a wait, the hosts will see when there are open tables upstairs, page the guests and send them up. A server then greets them, sees where the host had pre-planned for them in our system, and we seat them. Now that you know how that works, I'll also just add in here that I am one of the top servers in my restaurant, consistently selling the most every week, and I'm a trainer, so my managers all love and appreciate me and mostly have my back. Okay, so the Karen family is paged that their table is ready. They walk upstairs and stand by the host stand while I finish at my table and make my way over to them. I said, hey guys, how's it going? They just stared at me. Finally, the wife goes, do we just seat ourselves? I, holding a paper cocktail menu and silverware, after walking over to them and feeling like I had just made it clear I was about to seat them, said, Nope, that's my job. You guys can follow me this way. They follow to the six top tables and they all take their seats. I slide the silverware I was holding down to everyone individually instead of just setting six silverware on the end of the table for them to hand out. I said our menu is all virtual right now. There is a link on your table. I'll be right back. Come back and ask if they have any questions or if they'd like to get some drinks started. Again, silence. I just pick someone and say, okay, can I grab you something to drink, sir? We don't have what he asks for, but I suggest something similar and he says, okay. The wife asks what beer we have. I said, we have a lot. What do you like to drink? She said, I don't know. That's why I'm asking you what beer you have. I say, we have 27 beers on draft and 19 that are bottles. So if you tell me what you're usually into, I can guide you through what will work for you. She goes, Oh God, I'll just have a Bud Light since you can't sell a beer. I, looking stunned, laugh and say okay. Her husband turns his attention to me and says, Are you having a bad night? To which I say, No sir, are you? And he said, No, we're just trying to have a nice family night and you're rude. You've been rude the whole time and you threw our silverware at us. 
I'm stunned, so I just say, I definitely did not throw it at you guys. I was just trying to slide it down the table to all of you. Sorry if it came off that way. I'm not having a bad night, and I haven't had an attitude. The wife jumps in and says, It all started up front when you said, That's my job. Changes the entire tone I said this in, by the way. And now you've just been rude to all of us this whole experience. We're like five minutes in from them walking up to the stairs at this point. And then she yells so loudly, all my other coworkers hear, Your aura is ugly, and we don't appreciate that. Just send us a new server. It took everything I had, like I mean everything, not to say anything rude back to her. I just said, I'm happy to grab you a new server, and I'll just grab my manager for you too while I'm at it. My manager goes over, knowing everything from my side already, and they tell him I was rude by seating them and making that comment about how they could not seat themselves, when there was no host at the stand, so we just assumed it was pick your own table, and throwing their silverware, and my attitude and aura are just plain ugly. My manager stuck up for me and said I'm actually one of their best, but they still insisted on another server. Imagine being one of the three other servers having already heard and seen this go down and now it's your table. That server made a $6 tip on an $80 ticket by the way. Forget you guys, my aura is shiny. Edit again because people are sus. The bill for the couple I'm talking about after the six top split was $80. So $80 for two people, which is honestly pretty average, so maybe I don't work at the most upscale place, but it's not cheap. Definitely not a $6 tip cheap. Speaking of auras, what color is your aura? Please let us know. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. Am I the jerk for refusing to participate in my boyfriend's family's bizarre orange tradition? My boyfriend and I have been together a while now, but I hadn't met his family until a week ago when they invited us to stay at their house. I was very excited to meet his parents for the first time and they were super sweet when I got there. Both of them are lovely people and we all got along well. They gave us free reign to do whatever, but the one thing they insisted on was that we join them for their tradition of eating oranges as a family on Saturday mornings. They grow their own oranges and have been doing this since my boyfriend was a kid, so he was especially thrilled to share the tradition with me as a rite of passage. So the morning came and his mom brought in some fresh oranges from the garden. We sat at the table and I was getting ready to peel my orange when I saw my boyfriend's mom bite into her orange like it was an apple with the peel still on. I was so stunned when I saw my boyfriend and his dad do the same thing with their oranges, as if it were totally normal. I guess they noticed my shock because they asked me why I wasn't eating. So I started to peel my orange, but then his mom told me to stop, that I was eating it wrong and had to bite into it with the skin to get the full experience. I politely told her that I like to peel my oranges and I'm sure they taste just as great either way but she kept insisting that I had to bite into my orange for tradition. After saying multiple times that I'd rather peel it and the family, including my boyfriend, pushing back, I put the orange back on the table and said, though I appreciate the gesture, I'd personally feel uncomfortable eating oranges that way and I'd rather not participate. Things were tense after that and we left the next day. When we got home, my boyfriend chewed me out for being rude and embarrassing him and his family. He said I should have just eaten the orange the right way since his parents were gracious to let me stay with them. I can see his point and I apologized for causing any hurt. I really do like his family and think they're great people, but stand by my decision to opt out of the orange tradition. He feels like I could have compromised and I feel that I should be able to eat things how I want. It's a silly squabble in the grand scheme of things, but my boyfriend and I are really at odds about who's in the wrong and I would love an outside opinion. Edit. Some people have been asking what kind of oranges slash whether they're actually oranges. All I can say is that I was told they were oranges and they looked like typical oranges with thick skin. Edit 2. Lots of frequently asked questions, so I'll just answer them here. No, they don't just bite into it once and make it easier to peel. They don't peel the oranges at all. They eat the whole thing, fruit, skin, and pith, like one would eat an apple. Yes, it is messy. Yes, the skin is thick. The tradition involves eating the entire oranges like that, not just one bite. I do recognize that I could have surrendered a bite to keep the peace. However, this is the first time I've seen my boyfriend eat an orange. He never ate them with me, as he would say that nothing compares to his parents' oranges. He has seen me, our friends, and people in TV shows and movies eat peeled oranges, 
I assume the same goes for his parents. My boyfriend has never commented before on the common peeling technique. His parents do this every Saturday. I'm not sure how they eat their oranges on other days, but I imagine it's the same. The whole family is expected to participate every Saturday when at the parents' house, and I don't have to do it in my own home. The reason I didn't try one bite is mostly because I was caught so off guard since all my boyfriend had told me was that we were going to eat oranges. He didn't let me know about the method in advance, so I panicked. That and the insistence that I eat the entire fruit the way they wanted me to turned me off of trying it. I might be open to trying it in the future. I think that covers it. Thanks for the comments. I'll definitely share with my boyfriend. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk? Or is her boyfriend and his family? Please let us know. I think she's lucky she made it out of there alive, to be honest. This sounds like the beginning of a Stephen King novel. Force me to take two weeks of unpaid time off? Have fun running the place without me. I used to work at this one coffee shop. My first chain coffee shop after working only at local or family run ones. Simply put, it was heck. Owners would micromanage everything without knowing anything about how the business ran, never listened to their staff, and only cared about the money. Typical out of touch owners of a business. I was hired to replace a manager that had walked out on one of their locations, leaving it with only part time staff. I was told I was being hired on as the acting manager until they either hired someone else or they felt I would be a good fit for the position after my six month probation. I won't go into everything that went wrong because there's a lot, but to summarize, it was literally heck. I was expected to cover all no shows, which had me working 90 to 100 hours a week. I wasn't allowed to fire anyone no matter how many things they did wrong. Someone actually showed up to work drunk and I still wasn't allowed to fire them and any changes I wanted to implement were shot down, like replacing old parts in the espresso machine, shortening our hours to save money on labor, bringing in items that customers would always ask for. I was stressed, overworked, and irritated as heck when the owner comes in to talk to me about sales for the store. We weren't making enough to warrant the hours I had scheduled, and he wasn't going to pay me any more overtime. I would only work the hours I'm scheduled and if someone no-showed, I had to have someone else cover those shifts. I tried to explain to him that I only came in when no one else would cover. It just so happened that the people he allowed to continue to work here had terrible availability. Making the schedule was already hard enough. Getting someone other than myself to come in on their day off was next to impossible. On top of all that, I had to learn the ropes myself. There was no one to train me, so all the managerial knowledge, ordering, scheduling, I learned myself. No one other than me knew how to order coffee, had the numbers for the repair guys, anything other than making coffee and using the till. I was the only one that knew. He wasn't hearing any of it. Owner. All I'm hearing is excuses. This is your store. If you can't handle running it, I'll start looking for someone who will. Me. Wasn't that the plan though? It's been three months since my probation period ended and you never gave me the manager position, so I assumed you were looking for someone to take over. Owner. I think it's in your best interest to take some time off. Start thinking about your position here and whether you actually want to start moving up. I had mentioned in the interview I was looking forward to working my way up in the business. Me. I can't. There's no one to cover me. You're taking this time off. Is this a paid break? No. Consider this a time out for you to get yourself sorted. Take the two weeks to rest and we'll see what your position will be like when you get back. Me. Owner. I can't really afford to take that amount of time off. I can't even take two days off without having to come in and cover. Owner, don't worry about the business right now. It'll run without you. Now, to put into perspective, I was basically the manager at that point. I made the schedules. I did the orders. I knew the codes to the safe and the alarm. I wasn't allowed to hire someone to assist me and no one worked enough time to be able to cover even half of my shifts. I knew this. The staff knew this. Customers knew it. I made sure to block all work numbers and spent those two weeks looking for another job. I managed to find one after a few days that paid significantly more. I sent my resignation email to payroll and the owner, knowing he never checks it, deleted my account off the point of sale system, being a manager means I have access to it from home, and spent the rest of the leave catching up on my well-deserved sleep, having blocked all work numbers. I'm not getting paid, so I'm not working. According to my coworkers, Crap started going wrong the next day. One of the openers didn't show and the next staff member didn't have keys. Owner wasn't answering his phone, so they left a message. 
owner didn't show up until one of the regulars called, asking if the place was closed down. He showed up four hours after they were supposed to open. Orders weren't done, inventory was missed, four no-shows, you name it, it went wrong. Owner tried every way he could to get a hold of me, even using a customer's phone to call me. Too bad I didn't answer any calls that weren't in my contacts already. After two weeks, I turned my phone back on and get a call the same day from the owner. We agreed to meet the next day. Owner. So, you've had some time to think. Me. I have. It's really given me perspective on my position here. Owner. We can start you back on your normal hours for now, and we're looking for a manager to take on more of your responsibilities. Me. Oh, that's good. I'm actually quitting. He was silent for a few minutes. I think he was waiting to tell him I was kidding. Sucks for you, buddy. I'm serious. Me. I've already emailed payroll and removed my login from the computer. Here are my keys. Good luck. And I left. Owner tried calling me a few times, but stopped once I told him to check his email. I was on okay terms with some of the staff that worked there, and apparently the majority of them had quit after I had left. Owner did find a replacement pretty quickly, but without anyone to train them, owner didn't know anything about running the business. They were done for from the get-go and left pretty soon after they were hired. My petty self is always checking reviews from customers and employees and they have consistently sucked for the past year and seem to be on a downward trend over the past year. Edit. Wow, thank you everyone for the awards. I finally got to premium. Now my avatar gets a sweater. This particular job I had was soul crushing and I'm lucky to have a story like this to share with others that have gone through similar things. If someone is dealing with an owner similar to this, I highly recommend brushing up on your knowledge of your local labor laws. There are sadly way too many owners that try to get away with things like this. To clarify a few things, I'm from Canada. Forcing me to take leave was not actually legal of him to do. I was tired and so worn down that I just didn't want to fight anymore. I took it as a gift of all the days off I missed from all the overtime I worked and that was it. For those wondering about whether or not I'm owed overtime, thankfully I'm not. Another manager task I had was organizing hours and submitting them to payroll. Owners didn't have control over that. The managers, along with me, were in charge of that. There was a rule in place where we had to get approval from the person who made the schedules for overtime and that was me. So I got paid my overtime, thank goodness. Even if I did have some money owed, I personally just want to leave it be. It was hard enough getting my last paycheck from them. I didn't want to put any more energy into these guys than I had to. Have you ever had a boss who had ridiculous demands from you? If so, what did you do about it? Please let us know. I can't believe how you expect me to listen to you read these stories every day. I need a smoothie. Am I the jerk for trying to get my girls interested in my hobbies and interests instead of getting into theirs? I have two girls, 13 and 10, with my wife of 9 years. My girls are typical girls and don't have a lot of interests in common with me. I tried from a young age to get them interested in things we could share. They just never got interested. I'm talking things like video games, science fiction and fantasy books, Star Wars, Iron Man, Batman, etc. These are all popular things that I see a lot of other parents getting into with their kids. They're more interested in things I just can't relate to. The 13-year-old is into fashion, clothes, makeup, hair, all of that. The younger one really likes animals and Jojo. I've tried to be interested in their things. We watched this really bad, campy TV show called One Day at a Time, but I didn't like it and found the writing bad and they got mad at me when I would laugh. The older one likes the show Riverdale, which I admit was a little more interesting, but it was all a bunch of gossipy teen stuff. I just hit a wall. I couldn't figure out why I was going through all this effort to spend time with them when they obviously don't care enough to be interested in things I care about either. I tried to sit down with them and watch Mandalorian and they didn't like it. That really hurt me. Like, really, really hurt me. I know kids aren't going to be your own reflection staring back at you, but I thought I'd at least be able to share the things I love with them. I thought we'd get to spend time together instead of being one of those fractured families with no interest in each other. I told my wife that I was sick of feeling like an outsider in my own family and that I'd like if we could maybe do some designated time that we would do things I liked too. I suggested we could all sit down and learn to play this board game I like, Settlers of Catan. My wife told me that I needed to stop trying to force my stuff down their throat and find a balance somehow. I told her that this is the balance. I can't pretend to be interested in things like gossipy TV dramas, soap operas, etc. when that just isn't me. 
I'm not a teenage girl. I can't pretend to be one. Am I the jerk? I feel lonely in my own family. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or not? Please let us know. Oh, I can't wait to read what our listeners think about this one. Am I the jerk for asking my friend to remove her post showing she cleaned my condo? I have a chronic illness that often leaves me fatigued and in pain. Combined with diagnosed depression from this chronic illness and past trauma, at times I am unmotivated to shower, clean my condo, etc. I know it sounds gross, but unless you've been there, you won't understand. I do attend therapy and try to find the motivation slash energy, but once every few months, things get disastrous. I live alone, so it all falls on me. I have a cleaning person that comes in once a month, but she will come more if I ask her. All of this makes me feel vulnerable, and I try to hide this part of my illness from my friends. One friend, however, I ended up venting to. Said I felt gross, but literally could not leave bed without feeling exhausted. I said I was going to schedule my cleaning person to come, but my friend insisted on coming over herself. I offered to pay her what I do the service, but she refused. I did end up ordering us takeout as I wanted to compensate her in some form. She cleaned my kitchen, organized my living room, and did a load of laundry. I thanked her immensely more than once. Later that night, I checked Facebook and see said friend had posted before and after shots of my condo, saying, this is what a good friend does. They spend their day off helping a friend in a bad spot. She didn't tag me, but we have mostly mutual friends, all of whom know my condo. I have a one-of-a-kind sculpture that pretty much spells out it was me. There were also comments from others that did mention my name. I felt humiliated that more people had seen my condo at its worst. I already felt horrible having my friends see it in such a state and it took a lot to open up. I texted her and asked her to remove the post. She asked why and I explained what I just said, stating about a million more times I was grateful. She got mad and said that it's her social media and that she can do what she wants. I started getting really upset and frustrated and told her that I wish I had never told her. I ended up crying, reporting the post and going to sleep. The next morning it was taken down and my friend had texted me saying she was never going to help me again. A lot of our friends have sided with her, saying I'm ungrateful and over-emotional. Was I a jerk? Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or is their friend? Please let us know. That friend doesn't sound like much of a friend to be honest. I'd cut them out ASAP and I really hope OP feels better. Karen girlfriend refuses to pay rent. A bit of background. My girlfriend and I have been dating, not married, for three years. She's three years older than me and has two degrees, masters and bachelors from two prestigious universities compared to my one bachelors from a state college. We started dating at the tail end of our college careers back when we both had mediocre jobs. When I began my first adult gig, I felt a shift in our relationship as if she was envious about how quickly I was able to advance. Needless to say, I ended up leveraging my contacts and helped her get a similar position with way better pay than what she was making before. As I continued advancing in my role, I was given significant salary bonuses. And when I brought in more money, she'd casually make remarks like, Now you can be my sugar mama. Now you can pay for dinner. I can't wait to be a stay-at-home mom. And the kicker, you have to stop living in the mindset that what's yours is yours. And that includes finances. Every single time, I'd follow up with my own comments along the lines of, I'm not into that. Our relationship should be equal, 50-50. Or, maybe you can begin applying for promotions or positions that will pay more. Her classic answer, I like my job too much to do that. Side note, in my opinion, that's a BS answer and shows me that she does not want to apply herself or put in her own work to get a better paying job. But you be the judge of that. Prior to the home purchase, we sat down and discussed where we both stood financially and how the home buying scenario would play out. We quickly realized a few things. One, she did not have a significant savings. Two, she did not have the best credit. And three, she had overwhelming debt that I never knew about until this conversation. After moments of bickering, I made an executive decision to go in on the house by myself and mentioned that in doing so, she would have to pay me rent in exchange. She agreed. Fast forward to present day. The home was purchased and we moved in a week ago. It's in my name only. Mortgage is $2,100 a month. I asked that she pay $900 in rent. Last night during our date, she expressed how frustrated she was at me, said that me asking her to pay rent caught her off guard 
and that paying rent to live in our house irked her. I was shocked. I felt instantly uncomfortable, then drew back on the conversation we had when she agreed to pay rent. In short, her rationale was this. I don't believe in paying rent in a house I don't own. And we are partners. Maybe one day we will be life partners. It shouldn't have to be about money all the time. Ugh, help. I feel like she's manipulating the situation, but I also understand where she's coming from. Am I the jerk? Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or their girlfriend? Please let us know. I dare you to try to make me pay rent, Reddit boy. Competitor IT company steals our articles. I owned an IT company, we'll call it Ubertech, that strictly manages business networks, no website development, graphics, etc. One of my employees was tackling an interesting support request with instructions for making changes to a company's website. This happens from time to time when a customer gets confused with their various tech vendors or assumes that we provide all tech-related services. Being in earshot, I can tell that my employee's call was quickly escalating with a frustrated person on the other end and he has already offered to pass the call off to his manager. Me. Me. Ubertech, how can I help you? Angry website owner. Web owner. I want to know what's going on here. I don't know who you are. I don't know why you're calling me. And I don't know why you have my support information. Me. Sir, to be honest, I don't know who you are, why we are calling you, and why we have your support information either. But together, I think we can figure this out. I understand that you have a website and made a request for some changes. Who hosts your website? Web owner. Derp company. On their support website, there are instructions to send support requests. I followed them, and now I have you calling me with my support information. Me. Sir, I definitely want to get down to the bottom of this. We do not even offer website services. If you would please work with me, I'm sure we can get an answer. What I want to do is have you share your screen with me and then show me what you did to request support. I had him run our remote control software. He then proceeded to navigate to Derpco's support website, support.derpco.com, navigated through the customer self-service pages to a knowledge base article on how to submit a support. He pulled up this specific knowledge base article and I was staring at a verbatim copy of an article that I had written on our own website. There were no changes to the article, including the step to email your support request to and it was my company's email address right there. Me. Thank you for taking the time to show me this. I think I found the problem. Notice the email address in the instructions. It's telling you to email ubertech.com. That's us. Now, please allow me to show you something. I then scrolled down to the bottom of Derpco's plagiarized support article and noted the creation date, 2007. I then navigated to our company's support website, support.ubertech.com and navigated to our own matching article. We both confirmed that it was the same article and I showed him the creation date of our article, 2005. Web owner. Oh, look at that. Me. I think it's safe to say that Derpco has stolen our content, did not even update the instructions, misleading you to send the support request to us. Web owner. I'm sure you have a few things to take care of with Derpco. I would appreciate it if you do not mention us when you call them. Me. Of course, sir. Thank you for your time with this. I immediately searched Derpco's support website looking for more of our stolen content, found a total of five articles, and promptly printed them out and saved copies as PDF. So what to do in this situation? Do I call the owner of Derpco? This is a small town, so I needed to be clever and not taint my own image. How do I get revenge? Hire a lawyer? Leave the articles as is and hope more support requests come to us that can bring us business? Revenge unleashed. No, I wrote a press release. News release, release date for immediate release. Title, Uber Tech endorsed by local competitor. I got some great kudos from local businesses. One client in particular was rolling. Two days later, I get an email from owner of Derpco. I would appreciate it if you were to remove the press release from your website. This is a small town and it is just not good business. I went to their support site and still found three articles from our company. I wrote back and told him that I would be happy to do so, but there are at least still three articles on their support site that need to be removed. Two days later, I got another email confirming the articles were removed. Epilogue. In the end, I took down our press release, but still have a copy kept in our office and would tell this story to our new employees.
Am I the jerk for giving my best friend my money without consulting my wife? Throw away. I, 32, male, have been together with my wife, Erin, 31, female, for seven years now, married for three years. We have a daughter, Evelyn, who's one and a half. I have a best friend who I grew up with, Sarah, 32, female. We were neighbors from age four, went to the same college, and lived together as roommates until I got married. My wife and Sarah aren't best friends. They have never really gotten along, but they remain cordial with each other. My wife insists that Sarah is in love with me. She isn't. We are more like siblings since we are the only child of our parents, and they even refer to both of us as their kids. Besides, Sarah is bi, but has only been dating women in all of our adult lives. My wife and I make roughly around the same salary. I make 85k a year and she makes 87k a year. We split everything and designate a set amount for our joint savings accounts, emergency, vacation, and regular savings. We get to spend the remainder of our money on whatever we want. I don't consult her when I use my money and neither does she. Sarah has wanted to be a lawyer since we were in high school. She decided to take a gap year after undergrad and that gap year turned into many years. She lost her job last March due to lockdown and decided to at last finally go to law school. She couldn't afford all the high-end tutors and program, but ended up doing really well. She's depleted most of her savings, and I'm pretty sure she's down to her last dollar, but she hasn't asked me for a cent through all of this. She finalized all of her applications for law schools, but didn't have enough money to pay for it all. She mentioned it in passing that she has about 60% of the cost, but that means she'd have to eat ramen for the next months. So I decided to send her the money. She was extremely grateful and promised to pay it back. I told her not to. My wife found out from a mutual friend that I paid for the application fees and she's livid that I didn't consult her. I don't think I should have to since it wasn't money from our joint account but my individual account. She's given me the cold shoulder and she's now asking for the complete separation of finances. ETA, since many people have asked this, I gave Sarah about $3,000. In the past, both wife and I have given people money without consulting each other. I think her issue is primarily with the fact that the money was given to Sarah. Update. To answer a few questions that came up in the comments, Sarah didn't ask for $3,000. I estimated that the application fees would be around $1,500 to $2,000 and I added additional money because I know she won't ask me for money if she needs it. My wife found out from Sarah's friend. Like I said, we are part of the same social circle. My wife hasn't provided any reason why she dislikes Sarah or why she thinks she's in love with me. She said that it's her gut feeling and her gut is never wrong. I've made a few concessions in the past to keep the peace, like not making Sarah my best man at the wedding or part of the wedding party, not making her our child's godmother, although she babysits her the most, only hanging out with her when my wife is around. But I couldn't watch someone who is like a biological sister to me suffer because of how my wife feels about her. After reading the comments, I apologized to my wife last night and agreed to the complete separation of finances. She also asked that I have no contact with Sarah going forward. I told her that I'd need time to think about that. I couldn't stomach cutting someone off who has been part of my life for the past 28 years. She got really upset that I wouldn't agree to this right away and decided to sleep in the guest room. This morning, I received screenshots of text messages between my wife and Sarah that she sent her over the week calling Sarah all sorts of names and berating her. Her words were cruel and her reaction really is out of character. I confronted my wife for sending those messages when I'm the one at fault. She has left the house. I don't know where we go from here, but I'll be logging off for a while to attend to my kid and prepare for the worst. Thank you for all your judgments. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. Oh, I really hope you leave a comment with your opinion on this one. Entitled relative got destroyed by my mother. As with most Asian families, my family believes having a white collar job is above anything. This is very evident with a couple of relatives who forced their kids to go to medical school. Any career other than doctor is a sin in their eyes. My mother is open-minded about my choice of career. The only condition she had was I should have at least a bachelor's degree before getting a job. So I started working in an IT industry after college graduation. I have decent pay, able to learn and experiment in my own pace, and even got an opportunity to work abroad. I was happy with my career. Things weren't easy at first, as with all jobs. I struggled to settle down with the workload in the new city. I reached out to my family to help me find a job nearby my home. So my entitled relatives got a hold of this piece of news during a family gathering. 
Instead of helping me out, they scoffed and told to my younger cousins at large, See? This is why you shouldn't be an engineer. You're going to struggle and end up with nothing. After all, doctor is the most respectable job in the society. I blinked at her. I was shocked she could just insult my career in front of everyone. I was also disgusted at her because she's a teacher and I expected her to know better. I didn't want to make a scene so I didn't talk back, but someone else did. My mother. My mother is a single parent. She was a brilliant student at school and dreamt of being a teacher, but that was all gone when she was married off. She regretted that she was divorced and struggled to live. She wanted her daughters not to go through the same thing. She sold her jewelry and spent savings to get us decent education so that we could get a job. She was furious when someone insulted our hard work. She didn't hold back her anger as she thundered. Are you out of your dang mind, entitled relative? You're a teacher. Can't you show a bit of dignity while you speak? Don't you have common sense to think that your daughter couldn't work in a hospital with electricity, running water, machines, or software if there were no engineers? Even a janitor at the hospital have their value. If you insult my daughter or her choices, you will see the worst of me. The room was silent as everyone watched the entitled relative process what was going on. Nobody had ever seen my mother that mad, but it did a good thing. The relative never raised a word about her children's or my career after that. Also, two of my cousins got into engineering following the incident. Am I the jerk for telling sister-in-law that if I wanted her opinion, I'd have made her a bridesmaid? Me, 27 female, and fiance, 29 male, have been together for eight years. Until we got married, I was very close with his four sisters. Then when he proposed, I was frozen out. They had been fine with me being his girlfriend, but I didn't deserve to be Mrs. Last Name. We had been planning to ask all of them to be bridesmaids. I told fiance I'd still ask them to for his sake, but he refused and said they deserved nothing more than an invitation as basic courtesy if they don't support our marriage. This is when their attitude got worse. Anytime they could, they'd make crappy comments about me in the wedding. Make sure you find a plus size dress shop. I'm a size 12. I won't stay the night, it's not worth my time. Aren't you worried what people will think if you have roses? I know that from what my fiancé has been told, they are furious to have not been made bridesmaids and feel I chose to do that to exclude them from everything. That brings us to now. We had to cancel our big 2021 wedding due to obvious reasons. Instead, next year we're renting a 9 bedroom holiday home with a nice garden and having a small ceremony of 30 immediate family and close friends and then just a low-key party in the garden afterwards. We assigned bedrooms to our parents and bridal party. When we told mother-in-law, she asked where the sisters' rooms were. We told her all the other guests can stay at the inn, four-minute walk away. I checked, which is actually loads cheaper than the rooms we've paid for for the bridal party. Within three hours of speaking to mother-in-law, the eldest sister was on the phone to fiancé, crying that I have once again excluded his sisters and they are sick of me. Apparently, the situation had reduced mother-in-law to tears. Fiancé was defending me to her, but at one point turned to ask me a question about the inn. If they had family rooms, they do. And when his sister heard my voice, she demanded to speak to me. Fiancé refused and said he's her brother, so if she has an issue, to take it up with him. However, I'd reached the end of my tether and agreed to talk to her. She immediately began berating me, and I just snapped and cut her off with, Name! If I cared about your opinion on my wedding, don't you think I'd have asked you to be my bridesmaid? And handed fiancé the phone back. He hung up on her after that. His entire family is furious, and even my maid of honor and my parents have said I shouldn't have said that since it hadn't even been my decision about the wedding party, and I knew it was a sore point. They also said now if his sisters do show up for the wedding, it'll be really awkward for everyone, and no one will have fun and I've ruined the whole day. Am I the jerk for snapping at his sister with something I knew would anger her? ETA, please do not suggest eloping, but thank you for the comments either way. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her soon-to-be sisters-in-law? Please let us know. If they don't support your wedding, why are you even inviting them? So what, they're his sisters? Ma'am, just because I'm Latino doesn't mean I work at this restaurant. For context... Where I live, our state has recently allowed restaurants to open indoor dine-in services with expanded capacity. A couple of days ago, I go into one of my favorite restaurants, a Mexican restaurant, to pick up a takeout order. When I get there, the hostess slash owner told me it might take an extra few minutes 
because they've been bombarded by orders. Not an issue, I just wait. While I'm waiting for the hostess to come back with my food from the kitchen, I see some people I know at a table eating. They wave me over, so I go say hi to them and talk. In Spanish, we're all Latinos. While I'm waiting, next thing I know, I hear a woman say, Excuse me, excuse me. It took me a minute to figure out that she was talking to me because I looked around and didn't see the actual waitress inside. She was in the outdoor seating area. I make eye contact with this woman and ask, Is there something I can help you with? She rolls her eyes and replies, Yes, I've been standing here for 10 minutes and you refuse to even acknowledge me. I want a table for me and my friends. I tell her that I don't work at the restaurant, which she refuses to believe. I see you talking to a seated customer, and you clearly look like you work here. Mind you, I'm dressed in jeans, a sweater, and a mask. That's it. I firmly tell her that I don't work here to leave me alone and just turn away completely as I see the hostess slash owner come back from the kitchen. This is when she starts yelling. The hostess runs up and asks what's going on. The woman tells her, you have this rude jerk working here that refuses to do her job. All she wants to do is talk to her friends at that table. Points at the people I was talking to. I've been waiting for over 10 minutes for a table while she ignores me. This is ridiculous that you would hire someone like that. At this point, everyone stops what they're doing after she called me a name. Didn't hurt my feelings at all because I knew this is coming from a total random lady who is just the worst. The hostess slash owner tells her that I didn't work there and that calling me that name was disgusting and to get out and to never come back. The woman just stutters a few times before storming out, saying mean things under her breath. I pay for my food, leave a huge tip, all while the owner is apologizing to me about what happened. I told her it was all good and honestly that it was way more embarrassing for the screaming woman who had all the color drop from her face when the owner told her that I was a customer and for her to get out. Am I the jerk for telling my brother his problems are not my problem? I, 30 female, have a brother, 33 male, and we grew up close. Our relationship hit a low point when he started dating my former school bully. It wasn't so much that I didn't think people can grow and change, but when he told me regardless of what had happened or what she was like, he loved her and I had to deal with it and that was it. And I gave it a shot. I love my brother, wanted to not cause any drama in the family, but she hadn't grown all that much. And then when I got engaged to my husband, she made a big deal out of needing to be my maid of honor and it drove me crazy. She never apologized, yet acted like she was entitled to the role and attempted to make our wedding about her. For example, telling me what flowers she wanted, calling my choices dumb, saying I needed a dress that would hide parts of me, what food she wanted, what color dress she wanted, telling me I needed to let her plan XYZ and saying I wasn't allowed to have my best friend in the wedding party. I put my foot down and said she wasn't going to be my maid of honor and I told her she shouldn't bully me to get what she wanted like she could when we were kids. She thought I was being really extreme and my brother told me I was a jerk for not leaving the past in the past. They ended up not coming to my wedding. He didn't invite me to theirs and we've been out of each other's lives ever since. I never met his kids and he never met mine. It broke our parents' hearts and it was hard at first. They struggled with their kids not having a relationship and they struggled with the family being very divided, especially when grandkids came along. But they adjusted. When lockdown hit, it hit my brother and his family hard and the troubles just seemed to keep coming. He started to go fund me at some point and when that failed and he exhausted all the help our parents could give, he reached out to me. At first, he said he wanted to make amends, but then the very next day of making amends, he asked me for money and babysitting. I told him no. He said he and his wife were having a lot of financial problems and that I owed it to him and his family, that family should help each other when they have problems and he would do it for me. I told him that his problems were not my problems and whatever help he would have gotten from me ended when he let his wife treat me like crap and then called me a jerk for standing up for myself. Some of the extended family are now saying I'm the jerk and I should help my brother no matter what issues we have between us, etc. Part of me wonders if I should help. The other part of me is saying he doesn't deserve anything from me. Am I the jerk? Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or is her brother? Please let us know. He made his bed, now he gets to lie in it. Am I the jerk for not wanting to share the money my uncle gave me with my cousins? This has been causing tension since 2019 and I'm starting to have doubts so I would like an outside perspective. So, I, 27 male, 
had an uncle who was smart and a successful man in the corporate world. He married my aunt, his college sweetheart, a couple of years after they graduated because she got pregnant. She went on to have two more kids and since my uncle made good money, she became a stay-at-home parent. My aunt was kind of stuck up and put a lot of value into looking good and material possessions and raised my cousins, Brad, Jessica, and Lauren, 29 male, 26 female, and 23 female, to be the same. Brad would always brag about the latest and coolest things that he would get, while his sisters looked down on other members of the family for not having as nice clothes or houses as them, but would do it in a Regina George kind of way, so they could argue that it wasn't intended as an insult and would do a sorry, not sorry type of apology if pressured to. A lot of us didn't really care for their attitude and only really tolerated them for my uncle. Well, in 2019, a bomb dropped and my aunt was having an on and off affair with some guy she knew in high school. My uncle did a DNA test twice and none of his wife's kids were biologically his. Brad and Lauren were the on and off guy's kids and as far as I know, Jessica's biological dad is unknown. My uncle was heartbroken and furious and ready to divorce, but because his wife never worked during their marriage and there was no prenup, he was basically done for. My aunt knew this and showed no remorse. According to my uncle, she was basically like, either you stay and get over it or I take everything you have. My uncle was in a really dark place and we all tried to be there for him, but he kept walls up. He passed not too long after this and drained all bank accounts and racked up huge credit card debts. Most of the money he took went to either charities, people he liked, or organizations that he supported. But he sent $60,000 to me as a gift, so I would have to pay little to no taxes. I know because I got a notification from the bank and there was an investigation to make sure it was legitimate before I was granted access to the funds. This was a long and stressful process. My aunt's credit history was ruined and my aunt was forced to put her house on the market. I decided to keep my mouth shut about the money because my cousins were now going around begging for financial help and reminded everyone all those times they helped when we were in a financial bind. How family helps family. However, technically, they aren't family by blood or even spirit in my eyes. These were just the rude people I had to see and tolerate during family events that aren't really related to me. I'd rather just keep the money and save it for a rainy day or start a trust for potential kids. So, am I the jerk? Well, what do you think? Should OP share the money with his cousins? Please let us know. Of course not. Those people really suck. Soccer mom is mad I fired her no-show daughter. We've got entitled soccer mom. We've got her daughter who works under me and also plays soccer. She's 18. And we've got me. So this takes place a few years back. It was shortly before my store manager abruptly quit and I ended up running the store for a third of the year. Part of my role involved dealing with staffing issues. At this dress for less store, it is very hard to get fired for anything, including being a no-show. If you had two consecutive no-shows or three non-consecutive no-shows in a short period, you could be let go for job abandonment. You could call in all the time and still have a job, and some did for a while, but then you would get a lot fewer hours after that because we could not rely on you. My boss was still making the schedule and he based it around the availability that was provided to him by staff. So Entitled Kid had turned in her availability at the start of the semester and she was scheduled around that. She had maybe one to two days a week scheduled on tops. At this point, she had not shown up for about two weeks leading to three non-consecutive days. I worked that evening and tried to call her to get a hold of her. On the second day of her not answering about three calls, I decided to leave a voicemail. Hi Entitled Kid, this is OP at the retail store. Due to you having three consecutive days of not showing up for work, we are going to have to end your employment with us. Reach out to me if you have any questions. Thank you. It was the script my company gave me. I let the manager know and all was settled. The next morning I opened the store and at the moment I was in the office getting some paperwork ready for the day. The phone rang and I picked it up to an angry voice demanding to speak to me. I politely said that I was me and how could I be of help? She proceeded to yell at me how I ruined her daughter's day. I stated that I did not know who she was referring to, but that I do not recall doing anything today that could be looked at that way. She then told me she was Entitled Kid's mom and that what we did was unprofessional and horrible. I told her that since her daughter is 18, I cannot go into details of her employment. My daughter is just a kid, she screamed. Legally, that is not true, I replied. Well, you scheduled my daughter for times she cannot work and when she has school and practice, so she should not be fired. 
I calmly replied that we staff our store based on the availability that is provided to us and it is set in this system so that it will only allow that. She said that is not true and that her daughter is on a soccer scholarship at a local community college. I replied, that is good for her, but if she is scheduled to work and cannot, she needs to be able to let us know as we do have a business to run. My daughter is going to school on a soccer scholarship and she has to practice hard on soccer, so you have to work around that, she yelled. We staff based on the availability we are provided, and for staff to be employed here, they do have to show up for their shifts, I replied, a little testily. At this point, she follows up with, My daughter is going to school to get a much better job than you have in retail. She is going to be a teacher, I curtly replied. Oh, that's nice. One of my degrees is in education. And you work here, she said demeaningly. I do, and luckily it pays about twice as much as a teacher makes. So there is nothing in you that can talk down to me. I replied angrily as I slammed down the phone. The job market for teachers isn't good, and I wasn't necessarily delighted with my career at the moment due to some life situations. She called back immediately, and I picked it up, and when I heard it was her, I hung up again. She did not call back after. Karen demands to book her friend's bachelorette trip with my credit card. My wife has been asked by her friend to handle booking her bachelorette trip, which is already stupid because my wife isn't even the maid of honor. My wife, however, already agreed to do it without running it by me, but she doesn't have a credit card with a high enough limit to cover the deposit. Also, several people have been very wishy-washy about going on the trip at all. She invited something like 16 people, and over half of them have been back and forth about whether or not they plan on actually going. I don't want to be stuck dealing with the deposit on this trip if people end up backing out, or if something goes wrong and they have to cancel altogether. I don't think that's really all that irrational of me, but I came to this sub to find out if you all think I'm out of line here. My wife thinks I'm wrong to care because one, we can certainly afford it, and two, these are her friends and she can't imagine they would do us like that. They probably won't, but I wouldn't voluntarily put up thousands of dollars to find out. She also brought up that I forward funded my brother's bachelor trip, which only me and my three brothers went to Vegas. It cost $1,000 total and they paid up front. I don't see how this is the same thing at all, but whatever. Should I just let my wife book the trip and not worry about the potential, albeit low risk, of eating the cost? Thanks. Well, what do you think? Should OP book the trip on his credit card or not? Please let us know. Bruh. Entitled mom lets her brat play on the escalator, then yells at me when I tell him to stop. We've got entitled mom, we've got the dopey kid, we've got me, and we've got Jay, my partner. Now, to start off, I have irrational fears, and some of them even I think are absolutely stupid, but that doesn't change my completely ridiculous reaction to these things. Whales, big tall clouds that look like tidal waves, balloons, and escalators. When I was about five, I used to jump onto and off escalators for fear of getting eaten by the spiky teeth at the end. My dad, who, let's be honest, was only afraid of the price of a pint, thought as funny as this was, it had to stop. So we waited at the bottom and talked about how it worked until I thought I could do it without the hop. Stepped on fine, but alas, at the end, my raggy shoelace got caught and I absolutely panicked my wee brains out. He didn't try again, and I've been merrily hopping on and off for the last 20-something years. Today in the mall, I had grabbed some very light paint-by-numbers kits. I am a laborer slash operator by trade, and of course have gone and pinched a nerve in my lower back, so a few days off work is coming, and I will not stare at the wall the whole time. It hurts bad enough that my partner Jay was holding my handbag along with the heavier items we had bought. The entire ride after my half-hop grown onto the escalator, there was this kid, about seven or eight, running up and down, darting around people, just playing silly buggers. I ignored it as best I could, until we came to the bottom, where the kid was just standing there, staring at the ground, their feet half on and half off the later. I said, excuse me, quietly, excuse me, loudly, and finally, oi, kid, move it. By this time, I'm mildly panicking, backing up as fast as my useless back will allow with Jay trying his best to get out of the way and take the box out of my hands. The kid just looks at me and doesn't move, so I end up half hopping past him. His mother is at the end of the escalator and just starts laying into me. How dare I yell at her precious baby? He wasn't doing anything. 
Now, I'm not the nicest person at the best of times, and I was in nothing but pain as anyone with a pinched nerve can attest. So I snapped and told her an escalator is not a toy. Her kid is blocking the path to not only me, but elderly people, and she had no right telling me what to do if she couldn't even control a kid. All of a sudden, the security guy was there. I was thinking a mix between, oh crap, and how the heck did he get here so quick? Turns out he had already spoken to Entitled Mom about letting her kid run amok in the mall, and this was the final straw. Get your kid and get out. The look on her face was priceless. She started yelling at him instead of me, thank God, and security guy gave me the, you can go, wave. We could still hear her yelling when we walked out the doors a good 200 meters away. So, not super dramatic, but by God, lady, set a better example. Have you ever been afraid of escalators? Or what about elevators? Please let us know. Oh, don't even get me started on elevators. I can't stand those things. Never upset your farmer neighbor. You might end up really paying for it. So this didn't happen to me, but an attorney that I work with regularly as part of my job. He moved from a very high COL area to our rural community, sold his $2 million house, paid off and inherited from his grandparents, and bought 50 plus acres with a huge house in a bedroom community that has a lot of dairy farms. He always used to say how it was much better living up here, both in terms of the lifestyle and monetarily, as his urban $2 million house had property taxes in excess of $40,000 a year. Now, in addition to the huge house, the property was mostly fields, 40-ish acres, and had a 10-acre or so large woodlot. After he moved into his new house, the attorney was approached by his neighbor, one of the area dairy farmers. The farmer told the attorney how he had a handshake agreement with the former owner of the attorney's home slash property. The farmer would mow the fields for hay two to three times per year and would harvest a sustainable amount of trees out of the woodlot. In exchange, the former property owner got 10% of the chopped wood which was more than enough to heat the house all year long without having to run the oil boiler for anything more than hot water. The farmer wanted to keep this arrangement going, as it had worked out well for both parties for over a decade. The attorney thought the former owner was being taken advantage of and refused to do a handshake agreement, but told the farmer to give him a week to draw up a proper contract. The farmer was not overjoyed with making this out to be more than a gentleman's agreement, but agreed to come back the following week. The attorney decided that what would be fair was that the farmer should pay him $1,000 each time he mowed the fields for hay, since the farmer would feed the hay to his cows for free otherwise, completely ignoring that the farmer was using his own equipment and time to do the haying, and that the lawyer deserved 50% of the chopped wood, not 10%, or at least the 50% of the revenue the farmer got from selling the excess chopped wood, again ignoring the equipment and time investment of the farmer. As you can guess, the farmer refused. This all happened in late 2019, when the fields were rather bare and the supply of chopped wood for the house was full. Well, here comes 2020, and now the fields start looking like garbage, because none of the other farmers will pay to hay the fields. In fact, after speaking with the first farmer, all of the other area farmers are unwilling to mow the fields unless the attorney pays them $1,000 per mowing. And, of course, Come wintertime, the attorney's wood pile is depleted and he has to use the oil boiler to heat his entire home, costing well over $300 a month in winter heating costs. Now we come to early 2021, tax prep season. The farmer, being a good and dutiful community-minded citizen, informs the town that he did not cultivate any of the attorney's land for the entirety of 2020, nor did he know of any other farmers who did. Well, as it turns out, this is a big deal. Because in our state, farmland is assessed at a much lower value than residential property and additionally has a separate and lower tax rate. The attorney's land had previously been entirely zoned as farmland, except for the house and a few acres of lawn around it. Now the town sent out an assessor and rezoned the entire 50 plus acres as residential, which more than tripled the taxable property value and imposed the residential tax rate rather than the much lower farm tax rate. The attorney was quite surprised and furiously told me and everyone we work with all this past week how he's going to sue the town because they now expect him to pay 50 plus thousand dollars a year in property taxes. Am I the jerk for not accepting my aunt's gift because she always expects favors? I, 18 male, have an aunt who makes a lot of money and she always goes big with gifts for everyone. But the thing is, she always expects us to do any favor she asks for 
and if we say no, she reminds you what she got you. This has happened a lot of times with me. On my 13th birthday, she got me a hoverboard, and then every weekend after that, she'd ask me to babysit my cousins. No pay, by the way. Even once, when there was going to be a dance at school, I missed it to watch them because she made a big deal to my parents about me not appreciating what she had done for me by not wanting to do this favor. Another time more recently, she asked me to be her designated driver when she went out because she doesn't trust Uber drivers at night. I'm not even allowed to be driving that late. Got home at like 2 and had school the next day. That's pretty much how it is every year for everyone. She gives us new laptops, Apple watches, games, or just cash. But if we don't do something, she gets mad and doesn't stop talking about it. My birthday was on Friday, and she got me a car. I have her learner's permit, and I'm going to get my license soon. It's cool and everything, but I already know she's going to expect big favors over this, and I don't know if I want to be on the hook for that. I thanked her and everything, but I'd rather get my own car. And yeah, she was so mad, like red in the face, and yelling at my parents about how ungrateful I'm being, and any kid would be happy about a gift like this. And I told her I would be happy, yeah, but I already know she's going to be asking me for so many favors because that's what she does with everyone. Anyways, my parents got mad at me and my aunt stormed out of the house. All I'm hearing now is how ungrateful I am and I need to apologize to her. My older brother's telling me it's not a big deal and I could just say no when she asks for favors. But everyone knows when you tell her no, she turns it into a whole drama and just makes you feel like crap for not helping her. So I'd rather avoid it by not even accepting the car. They're still saying I'm not being a very good nephew for rejecting her gifts, so I gotta ask if I'm being a jerk over this. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his aunt? Please let us know. Definitely the aunt. But still, take that car, bruh. And next time she asks you for something, tell her to shove it. No, you can't have my ferret. Cast. We've got Entitled Mom. We've got Nice Kid. We've got Bandit. Ferret. We've got Snickers. Ferret. And we've got me. This happened in 2019, pre-lockdown. It was a warm day in the spring. I decided to set up the playpen, metal sides with no floor or roof, with a dig box, water, and tubes, and take Bandit, male, and Snickers, female, out to play. The ferrets are excited little critters and are war dancing and wrestling, basically just having a ferret good time. Entitled mom and nice kid come up. Nice kid, what are they? Do they bite? Me, they're ferrets, they're friendly. Do you want to pet one? Nice kid smiles. Yeah. I pick up Bandit and turn him in a way Nice Kid can reach his back, with Bandit slightly facing me. Nice Kid pets Bandit and giggles when Bandit licks her hand. I talk a little with Nice Kid about ferrets and how to care for them. Entitled Mom says it's time to leave, and Nice Kid says thanks and walks down the sidewalk chattering about wanting a ferret and how cool they are. Entitled Mom and Nice Kid come back and the following happens. Entitled Mom. Nice kid wants a ferret. How much for him? Bandit. Me. He's not for sale. Ferrets are a lot of work and need vet care. Nice kid, excitedly. I already have a hamster cage he can live in. Me. Hamster cages are too small, and I really care for Bandit and don't want to give him away. Nice kid looks disappointed. Entitled mom, ignoring what I said. You have two. You can give Entitled Kid that one. Bandit. And you can get another. I tell Entitled Mom no again, and Entitled Mom continues to go off on me about being selfish and setting a bad example. Nice Kid. Mom, Bandit is OP's. Entitled Mom ignores Nice Kid and continues the diatribe, now threatening to call animal control about me not caring for my ferrets properly. I decide it's time to take Snickers and Bandit inside. I pick them up and Entitled Mom snatches Bandit out of my hands. If you've ever held a ferret, you know they can be quite squirmy. Bandit squirms out of Entitled Mom's hands and falls to the ground, striking the playpen with his left front leg, then landing on the tube. What the heck, lady? Don't you talk to me like that. Me. Get out of here. I carefully step into the playpen, put Snickers down, and look for Bandit, who hid in the tube. In the meantime, Nice Kid managed to grab Entitled Mom's hand and pull her away. Entitled Mom is yelling the whole time about how she was calling the police and animal control. I had to take Bandit to the vet as he couldn't put weight on his front leg. While I was gone, the playpen and stuff went missing. Bandit had x-rays, no fracture, just a sprain and he was otherwise okay. He recovered fully. Neither animal control nor the police ever came.
Bury an old water tower to use as an emergency shelter? Sure, what could go wrong with that? So this actually happened to my dad a few years ago. He lived in an area right along the Texas Oklahoma border in a fairly rural area. My dad primarily worked in pipeline construction. One day, my dad noticed someone had purchased a very large property not too far down the road. Turns out that the new neighbor was actually from the suburbs around Columbus, Ohio, and had just won a lottery prize. The man hadn't won the jackpot, but had won a smaller prize, around $2 million. My dad was also originally from Ohio, so he decided to say hello. A few days later, he meets the auto neighbor. We'll call him Jim. Jim starts telling my dad about his dream to build his own self-sustaining homestead far away from the rest of society. Jim was very interested in prepping and convinced of a soon-to-come global societal collapse. He used his lotto winning to purchase the land and begin building his homestead. My dad honestly didn't find this that odd because many people in the area had some tendency toward independence and those prepping shows were popular at the time. About a year later, Jim reached out to my dad to ask for help with a construction project that involves burying a large water tower in the ground. My dad is a little confused, but decided to go take a look. Turns out, Jim bought an old water tower, about 15 feet in diameter and about 15 feet high, for the purpose of reusing it as an underground shelter. Jim had recently completed the build of a prefab home on his property and wanted the water tower buried partially under the new home, with a trap door built in a closet to access it. My dad immediately thought this was the dumbest thing he had ever heard and proceeded to tell Jim all the potential issues with this plan. Jim cut him off and told my dad that his contractor for the home had basically told him the same and so had several others he had contacted to try to get them to bury this water tower. However, Jim believed this was simply laziness on their part and had the utmost confidence in his plan. My dad left, but a day or so later, Jim contacts him again and asks about paying my dad to let him rent some construction equipment he had on his own property. My dad again goes over with him what a bad idea this is and how no legitimate crew would ever do this for him. Jim brings up using my dad's equipment and illegal laborers. My dad decides, well, if he's determined, might as well make a few bucks off lotto winner Jim. He quotes him some ridiculous price to rent his equipment and says he can ask a guy at work he knows about gathering up a group of day laborers. Jim agrees to the crazy price and my dad gets in touch with a friend who had a crew of day laborers. A bit later, my dad asks his friend about how the project is going. He tells my dad how nasty Jim treated the workers, how stupid the whole plan is, and how his specifications for how he wanted this build were completely idiotic. Whenever they had offered up suggestions or point out why something he wanted was wrong, he'd essentially shut them down and call them a bunch of names. So they buried the water tower and built this secret entrance exactly as he wanted, knowing it was completely stupid. He mentioned they only completed the job because Jim was paying them way more than they were used to making. Everyone agreed Jim was a jerk, but all the more reason to gouge your prices and take his money. A year or so goes by when my dad gets a frantic call from Jim. It had rained quite a bit, which was unusual for the area, and now the entire ground floor area of the back of his home was bowed upward about two feet. My dad goes to Jim's and takes a look around, realizing what has happened. Given that they had essentially just buried a large hollow object underneath his home, the rain caused the water tower to be pushed upward and right through his first floor. My dad explained the situation and Jim immediately lost it, started ranting about how he should have never used those laborers and how he was going to make them come fix it. My dad mentioned how that was probably impossible since most of them go back and forth across the border, but Jim was livid. My dad later found out from Jim that his insurance would not cover the damage to his home because he had buried a water tower under it without telling anyone. He mentioned trying to sue the insurance company, but that went nowhere. He also tried numerous times to find the day laborers, but was told you get what you get when you hire illegal workers to do a project that would never have gotten a permit. Over the months afterward, there was a lot of fallout for Jim and he couldn't even live in his home due to the damage. It eventually was torn down to be able to remove the water tower from beneath it. He burned through his lotto winnings pretty fast, so we didn't have anything left to rebuild it. He ended up selling the land and moving away about a year later. What's the first thing you would buy if you won the lotto? Please let us know. Probably a new husband, to be honest. Am I the jerk for taking the last slice of pie from my pregnant wife? Okay, title sounds really bad. Here we go. My wife, 29, female, is in her third trimester, and she and I, 28, male, 
have been married for four years. My sister is an amazing baker and has always sent delicious baked goods to family members. It used to be that wife and I would split the goodies pretty evenly, except for the lemon meringue pie, which my wife didn't like, but I loved, so I ate most of that. However, since she's become pregnant, my wife has developed a sudden hankering for the lemon meringue, so much so that, well, she usually ends up eating all of it now. I'm usually at work when my sister delivers the pie, so my wife, at home, will get to it first. I asked if she wouldn't mind saving me just a single slice because I liked it a lot too and she agreed but then ended up eating it all and said she hasn't been able to stop her cravings. This happened for a second time then a third time. I know it's silly to get worked up over a slice of pie and she's pregnant so of course her appetite is greater but it was something I had been looking forward to and then my expectations kept getting dashed. The fourth time I again asked if I could have the last slice of pie. My wife said yes, as usual, and promised she meant it. This time, my shift ended early, so I arrived in time to see my wife chowing down. There was just one slice left, and she was eyeing it. When she saw me, she apologized and asked if she could have the last slice, that now that she had started eating it, she couldn't help but really, really need it. On the other hand, I had been looking forward to the pie all day. I said no. We talked about this, and you already had the whole rest of the pie. I then took the slice and started eating. My wife immediately burst into tears and ran out of the room, and she's been in there since and not talking to me. I now feel really bad. I didn't think she would react this way, and the pie was not worth whatever distress I caused her. Instead of lemon meringue, I only taste regret. So Reddit, am I the jerk for eating that slice? Edit. Wow, thanks for all the perspectives. A lot of this didn't occur to me. I'm still catching up on the comments, so apologize if I don't get to some questions. As a quick update, my wife came out of the bedroom and before I could say anything, she apologized. She said that she felt embarrassed about her eating habits for a while. She used to be an extremely healthy eater before the pregnancy. And when I took the last slice, it just drove home all those insecurities. She said she had felt bad every time she ate the pies before and was upset at her own lack of self-control. I apologized as well and told her my issue with the pie was a very silly, insignificant concern next to what she was doing, carrying a baby and I cared much more about her feelings. She was feeling very tired after that, so laid down for the night, but we agreed we would talk more about everything tomorrow. To clarify some things that I might have described confusingly, she did not eat a pie every day or anything like that. The times were spread apart. And no, I'm not aware of any eating disorders prior to the pregnancy. I'm getting some mixed responses about whether this amount of pie consumption is healthy, but I figure tonight wasn't the best time to bring it up. Also, my wife is generally a very thoughtful, considerate person with no track record of manipulation, so commenters talking about that don't need to worry. Again, thanks everyone for your input. Well, what do you think? Was OP the jerk or was his wife? Please let us know. And you people call me selfish. Instacart shopper freaks out on an employee at a different store. This happened to me a few weeks ago, and I'm posting because I haven't seen this person come into my store for a while now. I work in a small grocery chain that uses Instacart for grocery delivery. Since a lot of the shoppers do this full time, I've gotten to know some of them and a lot of the others know who I am. I live closer to another one of our stores, so I usually shop there if I have to buy food on my off days. One of the shoppers recognized me and asked me to help her find something that I didn't know about. Since it's a different store and not my department, I politely told her that I don't work at this store, so I have no idea what it was. And I'm not on the clock, so she should go and ask someone who works there. She became livid and started yelling at me, calling me a jerk and saying that it's my job to help her because I work for the company. The general manager of this location, who I had previously worked with at a different location, was luckily in the next aisle over and came over to see what the commotion was about. She asked me what was wrong, which set the shopper off even more because it was obvious that we knew each other. So she called me a liar and screamed even more about how bad the customer service was. The GM and I were standing there, staring at the shopper, when the GM all of a sudden yelled, He doesn't work here. If you need help finding something, why don't you go to his store and ask him there? The shopper went silent and became white as a ghost with embarrassment. You could feel the gears and cogs in her head come to a grinding halt. Then came to me and yelled some more about how I should have told her I did several times. Eventually, the GM told her to leave the store because they were refusing her service for causing a scene. Two days later, guess who walks into my store and needs me to serve her from the deli? At that time, I was the only person on the counter, so she glared at me from a distance. 
probably waiting for someone else to come out so she could ask them for help, and I waved at her. Then she walked away, didn't get any of the items she needed. About an hour later, I got a call from who I assume was her customer asking why we didn't have any of the five items that he had ordered. I told him that we in fact had everything in abundance and he should talk to the Instacart customer service about it to file a complaint. Not only was this shopper kicked out of one store and failed to deliver one order, but she very obviously failed to deliver on part of a second order as well. Now she doesn't take on any orders that involve her coming to my store because I haven't seen her for a while. Am I the jerk for shouting at my brother's girlfriend to stop copying me and being obsessed with what I eat? I've been called a jerk by loads of people today, and I don't know if it's my pride keeping me from accepting that, but I decided to post on here. So, my brother's girlfriend moved in with us about a month ago. I don't mind her, but my god, she's absolutely obsessed with what I eat. I'm talking following me around the kitchen, asking me for specific calories in my meals, serving herself the same portion sizes as I when we have dinner, copying the foods I make, asking me to write down certain recipes. It honestly feels very overwhelming. I've spoken to her about this as well as my brother, and the general consensus is that she's trying to get healthier, and apparently my meals motivate her to do so. Editing in. This upsets me because I have a particular diet that I need to follow due to my severe stomach issues, and she's making it seem like my dietary requirements are her new fad diet, and I know for a fact that she didn't eat like this before she moved in with us. Well, the issue is that the food I eat is absolutely not enough to sustain her. I'm barely 5 feet and eat small amounts due to my stomach illness that limits how much slash what kind of food I can keep down at times. I've told her this, but she doesn't care as she thinks it might get her fitter sooner. I expressed that I felt uncomfortable being stalked around the kitchen every single day, but she just would not stop or listen to me. Today I woke up and went to go get an Actimal from the fridge, and as if she was waiting for me, she rushed out of her bedroom and followed me step by step to the kitchen to also grab an Actimal. At this point, I was just so uncomfortable and frustrated and semi shouted at her if she could please get off my case and go research healthy meal ideas on Google instead of stalking me around the kitchen. She left to go back to the bedroom and seconds later my brother came out asking what my problem is. And then, like the domino effect, my mom also caught on to what's going on and told me to apologize to her for being unkind. So, am I the jerk for asking her to stop obsessing over and copying what I eat? Edit. Just to add why it bothers me that she copies the food I make. So for example, the last time I had a really bad day with my stomach, I could barely eat and made myself some plain rice and boiled veggies. She literally didn't eat anything all day until I made myself that food, and then she quickly followed to making the exact same thing. That really upset me, because I can't control if my illness will be bad or not that day, and it's not my choice if I have to eat super bland food, but she makes it seem like my dietary requirements are her new fad diet. I keep getting asked why I didn't speak to her about this before today, but I did, and to my brother. I mentioned this in my post twice. I highlighted it, so hopefully you can see. I told her how uncomfortable it made me that she kept stalking me around the kitchen all day every day and even offered to help her find some healthy recipes on Google for her to try out, but she was not having any of it and carried on following me around the kitchen. Well, what would you do if someone kept following you around the kitchen and copying everything you ate? Please let us know. I'd probably put some laxatives in their food, to be honest. He's your brother. My dad remarried when I was seven to a woman who is mostly fine, but very spoiled and a terrible mother, unless it's on her terms. They had my little brother when I was 13. I was in boarding school at the time and eventually ended up being brought home to help her out and go to the local school. I'd be woken up by little bro every morning. I'd get him breakfast, get him dressed, get ready for school, and then have to wake the stepmother so she could look after him while I went to school. As soon as I finished school, she'd leave the house and leave me with him. I'd have to take him with me everywhere I went, do the chores around the house, literally raise him. Anyway, school only goes to a certain age and I had to leave again to continue my education. I missed him like a son. I moved to a single bed apartment and they came to visit where I live. They were staying with her cousin who has a lovely place not too far from where I lived and easy access on public transport. I didn't drive. Initial plan was that I would go there and hang out for the weekend. I get there with my bags, and as this was a few years ago, the conversation went along these lines. Stepmother, I'm going to go out tonight with some friends. Me, no worries, little bro and I can chill here. It would be better for me if you took him to your place. 
Mind, I had just got there, with my bags on public transport. Me, a pushover. Okay, I guess he can sleep on a blow-up mattress. I call the boyfriend, and he comes to get the little bro and I, and takes us back to my apartment. He plays with us for a bit and goes home. Around 4 the next day, Saturday, my stepmother calls and says she'll collect little brother on Sunday, and can I meet her somewhere halfway, as she doesn't want to drive all the way to my house. Again, I say fine. I want to spend time with my little brother, because even though she's a crazy lady, he's an ace kid and I love him. Go to meet her on Sunday. We have the following conversation. Me. It's little brother's birthday soon. What are you getting him? He wants a PlayStation. Me. While you're here, I'd like to take him to the toy store and let him choose a present. Oh, well, why don't you just buy it for him if you're going anyway? Note. I am an 18-year-old paying for her own apartment, studying full-time and working nights. I haven't taken a dime from my family since I was 15. I'd saved up just to get him a present and had a budget, and getting him a present meant that I would have another month in shoes for work that had holes. Me. I can't afford that. Stepmom. You can afford an apartment. Plus, he's your brother. I was gobsmacked. There's no great comeuppance. I just said again I couldn't afford it and changed the subject. I still wish, 15 years later, that I'd said, He's your son. So Karen, what did you think of today's stories? They were horrible. Horrible? How dare you? These were some of the best we've ever read. Oh, shut up, Mr. Reddit. It's ridiculous what people like myself have to go through. Dealing with stupid people like yourself and your subscribers. Look, Karen, you can say whatever you want about me, but don't you talk about my re-army. Tch, re-army. Most of your viewers aren't even subscribed to your channel. 70% if I'm correct. Well, I can't argue with that. That's true, most... Most of my viewers don't actually subscribe for some reason. It's because you're stupid, Mr. Reddit. No, I'm not. All right, guys, let's prove Karen wrong by making sure you're subscribed to the channel and turn on notifications. Pah, they're not going to listen to you. And if you'd like me or Karen what? to record a special message for you, come visit me on Fiverr. Link pinned in the comments below. Never. And join as a channel member today and Karen will give you a special shout out in the next video. Like heck I will!